Hi, uh, good, uh, good evening all. I welcome you to day three of ILS. I welcome chairpersons for this session, expert surgical and video session. Dr. Silvio, he is head of transplant center and HPB surgery as University Hospital Tubigen. And Dr. Piyu Shani, he is head professor and head GI surgery at Ames, New Delhi. I would like to involve first speaker, Dr. Hugo. He is professor of surgery, Nova Medical School, Lisbon, Portugal. Dr. Hugo, please. So thank you very much. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, I don't know if you can see this now. Do you see my screen? Yes, okay. we can see that too. So good, good evening to everyone. Good morning. This is this is morning in Portugal. So I would like to thank you for the opportunity of presenting here in this prestigious meeting, and I would like to thank the organization and greet all the colleagues that are uh, watching us now. So my talk is about in situ hypothermia and bypass for resection of liver tumors with IVC invasion. I'm going to present some illustrative cases of more simple and some more complex resections where we can see all the, so not all, but some of the variations that we have um, in this situation. So in the first case, this is a 63 years old female that had an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma invading the IVC and was submitted to a right hemiapatectomy in April, 2011. Uh, she had a small resection on the IVC this is the CT scan two years after, which showed no signs of recurrence. But five years after, she uh, recurrence is noted in the IVC and segment one. So for this patient, since it was not involved in the confluence of the hepatic veins, we scheduled uh, an operation with the resection of segment one and IVC below the hepatic veins with total vascular exclusion, but without using veno-venous bypass or cooling. And you can see here the start of the operation, so lots of adherences. This is the common trunk of the middle and left hepatic vein, the suprahepatic IVC that is controlled here. And you can see here the tumor uh, attached only to the IVC and to Arantius ligament. And we start the resection, we start the total vascular exclusion with clamping of the pedicle then clamping of the infrahepatic IVC that you can see here, and then the clamping of the suprahepatic IVC. Since we're not planning more than 25 to 30 minutes of exclusion, the patient is not on bypass. You can see the, the infrahepatic IVC just below the hepatic veins here, and uh, part of the Arantius ligament that is uh, detached now. The reconstruction, we usually use uh, PTFE reinforced grafts um, with coated heparin usually. And this is the anastomosis of the upper parts. This is the anastomosis of the inferior parts of the IVC that, is, that was removed. And this is the final part with the unclamping. So this is of course a, a simpler case and of course, a less uh, risky case. So unclamping of the pedicle, unclamping of the IVC below and above. And we see the final aspect after resection and reconstruction with the, the grafts in the replacing the IVC here. So final aspect again of the apotectomy, we managed to conserve practically all of the liver. And we can see here that uh, there was no gross invasion of the, of the inside wall of the IVC. Second case is a 67 years old woman that has an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma involving the right lobe, the IVC, and the confluence of the hepatic veins. She was submitted to a portal vein embolization, but for these patients, we planned um, in situ cooling and uh, venovenous bypass during the resection, uh, because of course this involves uh, uh, a reconstruction that is more complex, and we are counting on uh, 
lot more time with total vascular exclusion. So we plan the right resectionectomy. This is the start of the operation. We can see here, we control, at this point, we controlled the, um, the portal pedicles uh, from for the right. This is a left accessory vein. We start putting the patient on bypass. We usually use ECMO because our team is, has a lot of experience in ECMO and it's uh, easier to, to manage. This is the epitectomy under ECMO without vascular exclusion. We are leaving the, the part of the vascular exclusion to the end because the, the splenic, uh, uh, what ECMO does during epitectomy, it allows us to have a cleaner field also. So for most epitectomies, we can do this. This is the right branch of the bile ducts that is controlled here. And then ligate it and cut. So continuing the epitectomy, the artery was cut. We have now cutting of the artery and then the right posterior portal branch that is also ligated and cut. So at this point, we are approaching the end of the epitectomy. We test the, the perfusion in the portal vein. And at this point, we, we prepare to, to start total vascular exclusion. We do, of course, a, a pre-test with the clamping to see if the patient tolerates, although with ECMO, it's highly likable, highly probable that uh, it will be tolerated. And so we start total vascular exclusion under vena venous bypass. This is the clamping of the hepatic pedicle. Uh, inferior IVC, then superior IVC. The left hepatic artery accessory has to be controlled also, evidently. And we start the total vascular exclusion uh, and the perfusion of the liver with preservation solution. So we try to limit the time of vascular exclusion to the minimum possible. This is the removal of the specimen. We then replace the IVC Again, with the reinforced grafts with the PTFE that we are using here, the upper part of the nest nose is done. We then use uh, an orifice. We, we produce an orifice for the implantation of the left hepatic vein, in this case with, the, with some plasty of the middle also, in order to, take, to, to use it to, to be a little broader. This is the inferior part of the osmosis. And then this is the anosmosis of the implantation of the hepatic vein in the grafts. So this is the final aspect before unclamping. In many ways, this is a lot like we do in transplantation. So we remove the, the portal perfusion after flushing with saline. And then we unclamp the pedicle. We unclamp the accessory vein, the accessory artery for the left, inferior IVC, superior IVC also. And this is again the final parts of the resection. As you can see here, the final aspect of the resection with the specimen. So let's just quickly show a third and probably more complex case of a 67 years old female with an interpretic colonial that involves the IVC right and middle hepatic vein. In this case, we decided to perform a central hepatectomy with reconstruction of the IVC of the hepatic, the right hepatic vein. And this is what is shown here. It's the first part of the central hepatectomy. In this case, we use the, 
a slightly different technique. This is the left part of the central epitectomy, the right part of the central epitectomy, where you can start exposing the right hepatic vein also. Here we used um, a portocoval bypass to, to use uh, ECMO with the need only of two cannulas and obtain uh, and avoid congestion of the splanchnic uh, area also. So ECMO is being used here. Last part of the hepatectomy. And you can see here the right hepatic vein that is being cut. Then we cut the inferior uh, IVC above the resection area and below. Removals of the specimen. And in, for this case, we use the grafts of uh, IVC and iliac vein, the cadaveric graft. You can see the when available, it's a good alternative and it's a good graft. So this is reconstruction. Then the reconstruction of the right hepatic vein. The video is sometimes not very clear, I'm sorry. This is the inferior part of the reconstruction. And you can see also here, the reconstruction of the right hepatic vein. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity of presenting this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hugo. For next talk, I would like to invite Dr. Ruslan Alikhanu. He is head of Department of Clinical Research Center in Moscow, Department of Liver and Pancreatic Surgery. Dr. Ruslan. Thank you very much. I open my presentation. Just a second. Uh, do you see my? Yes, we can see screen. Yes, Dr. Ruslan. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, we will, I, I will talk about complex hepatectomy with vascular reconstruction for local advanced HeLa hemangiocarcinoma. Uh, <clears throat> some aspects of Klaskin tumor very important that resection is the only radical option. Uh, negative resection margin improve long term survival and vascular resection can achieve negative resection margin. If you look at the West experience, uh, the mortality in Klaskin tumor is still high. And if we look uh, to hepatic artery resection, especially for hepatic artery resection, some data show, sh shares that mortality is very, very high and long-term results are very poor. But if, if we look to East experience, especially in the Guinea group from Nagoya, uh, we may see that Mortality rate is uh, near 2% and long-term survival is 30%. We analyzed our own uh, uh, data, preliminary data as uh, uh, early and long-term outcome after resection for HeLa carcinoma with and without portal and hepatic artery resection. Uh, included patients from 2015, 102 patients and 40 of them had vascular resection. For left or left extended hepatectomy, we used uh, directly venovenous anastomosis or very rare peritoneal graft or allograft. And for right extended hepatectomy, uh, usually it's enough to do resection, bifurcation, and direct uh, portal anastomosis. Uh, in, we had 12 patients with hepatic artery resection. <clears throat> Most of them had uh, 
left hepatectomy because most of the time right hepatic artery are involved. So in uh, cases of hepatic artery resection, most of the time we use uh, arterial hepatic appropriate directly anastomosis with right hepatic artery. In five cases, combined portal vein resection. Uh, we had some vascular anastomosis specific complications. Uh, most of them were coagulopathy bleeding after hepatitis overdosed. Unfortunately, one patient after portal vein thrombosis was died. Uh, and one patient with arterial thrombosis that was managed by ultrasound and CT, uh, but without any clinical evidence uh, managed conservatively. So comparing these two both, both groups, we found out that complications are much uh, significantly uh, higher than in vascular reconstruction group than in uh, well, without vascular reconstruction, but mortality and uh, five years survival and also other rate uh, was high in both groups. Uh, so we have found out in our experience that there is no, no significant difference we're seeing in mortality and late outcome by involving and block liver combined vascular resection. So I would like to present uh, one patient dramatic uh, with a, a hilohalangiocarcinoma 3B. Uh, this is the 3 the um, reconstruction of hepatic artery and here not only right hepatic artery but also hepatic artery propria was also involved in the in, uh, tumor. So uh, this is the beginning, uh, the start of operation when we transected the bile duct and you see that the very inflamed area in hepatodonal element we took the right anterior and posterior hepatic artery. This is the um, arterial hepatic propria and uh, portal vein. And uh, well, if, if we do direct anastomosis here, we would find out that there's a large gap between arteries. So uh, uh, anyway, we, we always start with uh, um, yeah, to achieve maybe much more free area to isolate portal vein. Uh, but uh, we see here that confirmed that uh, direct invasion to the portal vein, and we stop here. And this is the scheme of operation. When the tumor invaded to the uh, arteria hepatica propria, and we have a good flow in arteria gastrodunalis, uh, we may use the apple B type procedure in um, in a um, hepatic artery reconstruction. So uh, in our operation, we transected the <clears throat> common hepatic artery at the, uh, at the uh, celiac uh, uh, axis. And then <clears throat> after transection, we translocate the, the common hepatic artery to the right and uh, made a uh, anastomosis between common hepatic artery and uh, right hepatic artery. We made artery first uh, um, operation, then we done left hepatectomy with bile duct resection, portal vein uh, resection and reconstruction. And this is the final aspect of operation. Uh, I will, no show, uh, will not show all the, <clears throat> all the video, but I want to show that they, um, hepatic artery reconstruction in Klatskin tumor sometimes is very challenging and very demanding because of uh, uh, here I ask the operator to show directly to, to this artery inside to show that the intima in patients with Klatskin tumor are very different and vessels are very different than we see uh, even in difficult liver transplant or other cases. So because of inflammation, halangitis, uh, bile leak, uh, many times drained before treatment of antibiotics, we can see that uh, the arteries are very tight, the intima is very inflamed and uh, very easy destructed. <clears throat> and it is important to do reconstruction and to see that um, the, you, you um, yeah, use the good intima. If not, I think it's better not to, to even to try just to reject and to use uh, graft in this case. Here we had a uh, five millimeter diameter um, artery and uh, after some trimming, 
received the uh, relatively good intima and uh, uh, made this anastomosis. And if the artery is less than two or less than two millimeter, we use uh, microvascular uh, technique. And after uh, uh, we use artery first technique because in the end of operation, we also check how it's working. Then we done left hepatectomy. There's nothing special in that. And then uh, reconstruction, resection and reconstruction of portal vein. In left hepatectomy, it may be quite challenging in, in many cases because sometimes it's difficult to uh, mobilize right posterior and right anterior portal vein for isolation. And also <clears throat> uh, difficult uh, if, if you have inflammation and also uh, the big gap between uh, the portal vein, sometimes you need more complex uh, resection. In case of extended uh, right, uh, left resection, uh, so you should use uh, anastomosis among the common portal vein and uh, right posterior portal vein. So uh, uh, before uh, where we tie, we pu push the flow and uh, the tie with uh, usually as in transplant surgery, we use uh, some uh, growing factor after uh, pushing the flow of portal flow. You see. And this is the final aspect of operation. So this is the common hepatic artery used uh, in translocated anastomosis with, with the right hepatic artery. This is arteria gastroduodenalis, reconstructed portal vein, bile ducts, resected first segment. Uh, Thank you very much. I want to congratulate uh, Medante Institute of Liver Transplant and uh, wish them the further success and further achievements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ruslan. We will take questions at the end. I invite Dr. Dennis Balsi. He is Director of Liver Transplantation at Ankara University. He will speak on living donor rapid procedure in cirrhotic with HCC. Dr. Dennis. Kindly play his recorded presentation, please. This is Balji. I am uh, the director of liver transplantation in Ankara University. And uh, my task today is to present a case of rapid procedure in cirrhotic setting with hepatocellular carcinoma. I would like to thank the, the organization committee of the Fifth International Liver Symposium. Um, and it's a great honor to present here. I would like to disclose that one, one of the developers and shareholders of liver vision software. So it all started with uh, Paul Netline from the Oslo, Oslo Group uh, reporting a partial auxiliary partial segment two, three deceased donor graft transplanted into a patient who had non-resectable colorectal liver metastasis after removal of the left lobe. So they were inspired by the ALPS procedure and this was a deceased donor auxiliary split liver transplantation. Um, and what they were able to show is, uh, is the premise of ALPS procedure and repeatedly shown to hold that premise is a rapid, uh, rapid future liver remnant hypertrophy. In this case, it's the graft hypertrophy. And uh, then when it came to a sufficient uh, size, like in 23 days of 700 milliliters of volume, uh, they went on and did the second stage. And uh, they were they saw that it there were like 600 milliliters per minute portal flow in the second stage. And as seen on the right side, bilirubin and INR values normalized after the second procedure. In this setting, uh, the critical 
aspect was there were no portal hypertension since this was a colorectal cancer liver metastasis. And this is followed by uh, Koenigsreiner from the Tübingen group reporting a rapid procedure in the living donor liver transplant setting. Uh, they, the authors uh, performed the living donor uh, transplantation and have reported that it's a feasible and safe alternative to deceased donor rapid procedure. And <clears throat> this uh, brought uh, as to our experience with a 49 year old, 49 year old female with nasal cirrhosis, uh, and she had three centimeters of HCC uh, in segment seven. She was 88 kilograms with one, 158 centimeters tall with a BMI of 39. She had normal math score, but had significant ascites and diabetes. Uh, her only available donor in the family was her brother, 49-year-old male, 183 centimeters tall and 70 kgs, normal arterial portal biliary anatomy. However, the left load volume to total liver volume ratio was 22%. So he was not available for right lobe donation, uh, as was the plan for uh, his uh, sister, but uh, we, we decided to go for uh, the rapid procedure in the steroidic setting after informing the family uh, of the consequences and the procedure and obtaining the uh, ethical consent uh, from the IRB of our institution. Here we see the left lobe graft as has been uh, estimated to be 303 milliliters. And this video shows the technique uh, starting from the beginning. Again, she was 49 year old female, 88 kilograms, nasal cirrhosis and HCC. And the donor, uh, donor was at the 367. Here we see the 3D volumetry reconstruction. Uh, we estimated the GRWR is gonna be 0.4%. This is two arteries on the left graft side. And this is biliary anatomy. In the donor surgery, we mark with two markers and obtain cholangiogram and uh, detect the potential division site of the bile duct as seen here. Left bile duct is divided and this is followed by left hepatic vein division and the graft is out and it is measured to be 314 grams, slightly a little bit more uh, than what we measured beforehand. And two arteries on the graft were unified to a single artery, anastomosing end to side, end to side uh, of the segment two, three artery to the segment four artery, and uh, having a single orifice uh, on, the, uh, on the table when we actually plan to transplant. This is the hepatic vein anastomosis on the uh, left side. This is after left lateral sectionectomy of the cirrhotic liver. And this is portal vein anastomosis as usual. And then after portal vein anastomosis, we perform the hepatic artery anastomosis. This is continuous suture interrupted tie technique of the hepatic artery. And once this is completed, uh, we divide the right portal vein of the diseased liver and close the orifice and anastomose this right portal vein to a corresponding orifice that has been made on the IVC. As we see here, creating a HPC hemiporal cable shunt. And once the shunt is complete, we measure the flow on the portal vein and on, on the shunt. It's seen here, uh, 1200 uh, on the shunt, 460 on the portal vein, and the pressure drops from 20 millimeter mercury to 14 millimeter mercury. We take the right hepatic vein of the diseased liver uh, before closure completion, and we insert a catheter uh, for, to decrease the biliary system pressure. And after the operation, we see this is the day one scan and we see rapid hypertrophy of the liver as expected, 30% increase, 
first week 60% increase, third week now GRW is 0.6 and the hepatobiliary scan showing functional shift to the left side. Unfortunately, this patient experienced bile leak due to the catheter dislodgement. So we wait to wait for one more week for uh, to resolve biliary leak. And then we go to the second stage and we measure the por uh, portal and shunt flows in the beginning and then uh, decide to take out the liver. This is the right anterior and right posterior pedicures individually separated and divided using sharp division. And here we see the right posterior pedicule and see here. And finally, the right hepatic artery is divided. This is followed by division, stapler division of the right hepatic vein. Now the diseased liver will be out. After closure of the stumps of the uh, biliary pedicules, we measure the portal flow and shunt flow again and arterial flow. We decide to divide the splenic artery ligate, ligation uh, as portal inflow modulation. Then the final aspect showing seven millimeter mercury uh, portal pressure, 500 milliliter portal flow, and uh, slightly more than 60 milliliter per minute arterial flow. This is the final aspect of the second stage surgery. And after the second stage operation, the patient's uh, bilirubin and INR levels normalized gradually over the two weeks, and this patient was discharged three weeks after the second stage surgery. So rapid procedure in cirrhotic setting with LDLT is a promising procedure. It is a technically challenging uh, procedure and requires both living donor liver transplant and advanced HPV experience. Fundamental understanding in portal hemodynamics is important. The procedure decreases the donor risk, obviously, with donation of small volume liver and potentially increases donor pool in both disease donor and living donor liver transplantation setting. However, it shifts the risk to the recipient side with two surgeries. And the, one of the important premises of the procedure is timely transplantation is a curative option for primary and secondary malignancies that has to be validated, validated in the future with future uh, cases. I would like to say that we are determined to do that under the International Society of Liver, Liver Surgeons study groups. We are going to form a rapid procedure study group. The study group leaders will be Paul Dacklein and Massimo Malogo, and uh, I'll be chairing the scientific committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. For last video of this session, I request Dr. Sanjay Yadav. He will speak on ex vivo perfusion in DVD donor in novel technique. So, Dr. Sanjay is consultant yes. with us at Medanta team. Uh, is my slide is visible? Yes, visible. So, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Today, I'll be presenting uh, ex vivo organ perfusion in DVD donors, a novel technique. So as we know, cold dissection technique is a standard technique for organ harvesting in uh, DVD donors. In our techniques, basically involves the dissection of uh, uh, liver and kidney, uh, which we uh, in warm phases, which we do normally in the living, don living donor surgery and perfusing them in ex vivo. So, so to perform these techniques, the donor must be hemodynamically stable for at least one and a half hour to allow us to perform the dissection in warm phase and uh, the, uh, the surgeon must have extensive experience of uh, live donor surgery to perform the procedure rapidly and smoothly. And there's a good coordination among all the procurement team is usually needed. So the technique basically in this technique as a precautionary measures, uh, we uh, do the dissection of common iliac arteries on both sides inferior mesenteric vein and the supraciliac aorta so that uh, if the donor become unstable at any point of time, so rapid cannulation and perfusion can be done like in cold, uh, in cold perfusion technique. After that, the portal dissection is started where uh, first the cholecystectomy is done. And uh, here uh, cholecystectomy is being, being done. 
and the cases where both the cardiac and uh, all the ca cardiac procurement is also planned in that cases the hepatic dissection and cardiac dissection can take place uh, simultaneously in this case uh, cardiac uh, procurement was not planned so only uh, hepatic dissection was done and after doing cholecystectomy the next step is to do the uh, portal dissection and in portal dissection bile duct is looped then the common hepatic artery is dissected down to the celiac axis preserving all the branches of the celiac axis and the main portal vein is dissected up to the upper border of the pancreas so this was the complete portal dissections uh, in this case and after that the liver mobilization starts by mobilizing the falciform ligament and uh, right and left triangular ligament on either sides so this was just the mobilization of the liver once the liver is mobilized then the infrahepatic ibc is usually dissected and looped and after looping of the infrahepatic ibc we dissect the uh, ibc from the posterior abdominal wall so this is being done and uh, it is uh, it is being the infrahepatic vein sorry uh, adrenal vein is being divided and after dividing uh, dissecting the ibc then suprahepatic ibc is usually dissected by dissecting the um, phrenic vein on either side to get adequate length of the suprahepatic ibc so this is being done on the left side then uh, and uh, uh, to get the adequate length of the suprahepatic ibc usually uh, uh, a little bit of mobilization in the diaphragmatic hiatus is done so that is being done the same is repeated on the right side uh, by dividing the right phrenic uh, uh, veins so that is being done so this was the complete mobilization of the suprahepatic ibc with adequate length of the suprahepatic ibc now this completes the uh, dissection of the liver where the liver has been completely mobilized all around ibc has been uh, mobilized from the posterior abdominal wall so this with with this sub, with this much of dissection the dissection of the liver is completed and uh, so this is being shown the complete mobilization of liver with adequate mobilizations of ibc so after the mobilizing liver then in normal technique we usually uh, the sequence of harvesting of organ is like uh, liver is harvested first and then kidney but in this technique we usually modify the sequence of harvesting where the kidney is first uh, harvested followed by the liver so now left uh, uh, in this case the left kidney is first harvested followed by right so left renal dissection is being done and then um, Uh, left kidney is harvested by dividing the left renal artery and renal vein the stump on the ibc and aorta side is usually either ligated or clamped to maintain the continuity of the circulation uh, so because the liver is still in place so that is being done the left kidney is being harvested by dividing the left renal artery and then vein so after the harvesting the left the same is done for the harvesting of the right uh, right kidney uh, so the stump on the ibc is in clamped and once the kidney is harvested on both sides then the harvesting of the liver starts and here <clears throat> first the bile duct is divided and then artery is now uh, being uh, clamped down to the celiac axis preserving all the branches of the celiac axis so that's being done clamp is being applied down to the celiac axis so after division of the artery then again main portal vein is divided in the supra supra pancreatic part so with this the porta is usually uh, divided and now uh, clamp is applied in the suprahepatic and uh, 
sorry, infrahepatic IBC and uh, suprahepatic IBC, and uh, then they are divided. The idea of putting the clamp is just to make the surgical field clean of the blood. Otherwise, it can be divided directly also without uh, applying the clamp. So, suprahepatic IBC is being divided now. Uh, after dividing the infrahepatic IBC, the liver is being harvested, and we can see that, the, and the organ is being perfused in the veins. We can see that there is hardly much benching uh, remained in this case, and uh, after perfusing the uh, uh, liver, it is usually ready for uh, implantation in the graft, and there is a minimum bench work is needed. So this will complete uh, the our organ harvesting by our technique. So the advantage of this technique is the uh, saving the perfusion fluid. Usually three, four liters of fluid is uh, sufficient and it obviates the need and drill of ice cooling of the abdomen and chest and management of high volume uh, fluid circulation. It reduces the vein surgery and cold ischemia time. And we feel that when the dissection is completed in the warm phase, it reduces the chances of procurement related injury. So using these techniques, uh, we have done 12 procurements, liver and kidney in all, heart in four cases and mean retrieval time using this technique 74 minutes. These are the donor details. In, uh, and mean volume of uh, the perfusion fluid that was used in this technique is around three liters, and there is no procurement related injuries to the graft. So uh, the graft implantation in the recipient was by a standard piggyback technique with cold ischemia time of 145 minutes, and, there was, and the post of recovery was uneventful in the recipients. So the limitation of this technique is that uh, the donor must be hemodynamically stable for at least one and a half hour to two hours to allow the dissection to be completed in the warm phases. Pancreas and a small bowel procurement is usually not possible using these techniques. And this uh, a small number of cases we have done, and that is basically the DDLT at our center is uh, not done very, is not, uh, organ is not available, so it's not done very frequently. So we feel that validation of these techniques needs from a program which has both high volume of LDLT and GDLT. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. Mm -hmm. I request chairpersons, Dr. Silvio and Dr. P.U. Shahani for discussion. Can we talk? Can we speak? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you very much. I see you, Natalie, from uh, Germany, Tübingen. Thank you very much to all of you guys. Uh, excellent presentation, amazing cases. Uh, I don't know how to proceed. If from my side, I have many questions to each of you, and we can start, if you agree, with my co-moderator to ask one question to each uh, presenter and then going on. And, the, and uh, probably important to answer the frequent uh, so uh, questions. Sure. So, Ugo, do you agree? Yes, sure, sure. Okay. Should we start uh, um, uh, with uh, our friend Hugo from uh, uh, from uh, from Lisbon? So Hugo, uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, just for a didactic point of view, because we are uh, you are re you are performing really high hand surgery. Um, which is your suggestion? Watching these videos, you have the feeling, okay, I'm watching this and then go home and I'm going to do the same. Which, uh, what should be taken in, in consideration? Do you need, uh, I, can be done by everybody or do you need the expertise also from a, a transplant uh, a surgery? And that for me was an important role of an anesthesiologist. Yes. Thank you very much, Sylvia. That's a very interesting question. I think that, first of all, this is, of course, uh, something that has to be restricted to large volume centers with a lot of experience in liver surgery. For example, in our center, we are doing around 400 a year in the liver surgery besides transplantation. I think for this particular type of surgery, you have to have experience in transplantation also. I think this is critical. And uh, of course, you have to have a team that uh, is able to cope with all of the variation that this demands. You have to have intensivists that are used to, we prefer to use ECMO with the support of an intensivist team because I think it works even better than just regular uh, veno venous bypass. And of course you have to have uh, highly trained uh, anesthesiologists. And I think with this, my experience is even for patients with, uh, that don't require 
um, uh, venous venous bypass and the cooling because the reconstruction is less complex. For example, like the first case, the first case we, we did about uh, uh, maybe six years ago. Uh, now we are doing practically all the cases with ECMO because uh, there, is a, um, there is a congestion of the liver caused by the tumor of the, um, and drained by the hepatic veins that turns the hepatectomy really difficult in some cases. So I think, uh, I think that, uh, that systematic ECMO is usually a good thing for these cases. Thank you. My co-chair has a question probably for you too. No, please go ahead. Okay, then uh, there is a question. Uh, so uh, I say, uh, um, Alejandro for, ask, uh, so uh, there are groups that try to avoid by any way the, the bypass with hypothermic perfusion, for example, in Argentina, using Porto Cavachan. What's uh, your current opinion? So what do you mean? about alternative to using uh, so uh, vino vino bypass or ecmo hugo i think there there are many alternatives i think you can perform ex but your opinion we can perform ex situ and we do this also in some cases that we imagine that the reconstruction is really difficult we do uh, we implant um, an ivc graft we do a portocavo shunt we don't use bypass and we do it on the bench my opinion is I prefer in situ. I prefer using ECMO. What I restrict is cooling and perfusion. This I restrict to patients with complex vascular reconstructions. ECMO I usually prefer to use. Thank you, Hugo. Now we move on to, to Rusland. Then my coach has a question to, to Rusland. I have uh, some. So um, yeah. my comment uh, there was that it was a very nice video. Uh, my question is that uh, you mentioned that there's a lot of inflammation in these patients, uh, obviously because of uh, the biliary obstruction, they've had recurrent episodes of cholangitis. Uh, would you consider doing this procedure in any other manner to avoid the inflammation? For example, without a preoperative intervention, for example. Ruslan, the question is for you. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, uh, the the problem is that because of the referral uh, center for Klaskin tumor now and uh, the country is big, uh, usually we receive patients from all the country and uh, they already have drainage or stenting of bile ducts. So uh, we cannot uh, do that most of the time. Uh, but actually we prefer, uh, um, if, if patient has had a uh, hollanditis drained previously before, before radical resection, uh, we see the bacterial um, growth uh, trying to do eradication, but it's not always uh, possible, of course, but just to decrease before operation uh, and then uh, to do radical operation. We, we plan to start study prospectively uh, to see um, the, the, the situation when we do eradication or not to do. Is it possible or not before? Because the, the because most most of our patients are from different centers and uh, most of them are already drained and we need to redrain or 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 just manage what we have uh, already so hope that i asked the question but but in terms of hollandiitis i think if if patient fastly in, uh, evaluated after his jaundice, uh, we see, and we do not don't need to modulate, for example, uh, optimis or to do optimization of a future remnant liver. I think uh, it would be better do uh, do radical procedure uh, without anything. But this situation in in, in, in around us is are, are very very rare. Thank you.
Thank you, Ruslan. So just, just to stay in time, very short technical question. First of all, uh, why do you perform artery first? Uh, so we have heard that, that uh, terrible situation, uh, you know, inflammation and so on. I did uh, last night a very small pediatric uh, liver transplantation. No, I we do the artery as the last because when you move the liver and uh, back and forth, then you say we I do the artery first, then I cut the liver and then then. And, but if you're going for myconostomosis, I would be afraid. Can you comment this and the uh, the second question very short, what about anticoagulation management, the management of uh, prophylactic antithrombosis of uh, portal vein reconstruction and arterial reconstruction? What do you suggest? Yeah, Start. asking the first question, uh, we start, yeah, do you hear, yeah, thank you, yeah. thank you for the question. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, we do uh, artery first uh, in, in taking into account two, two aspects. First, oncological. Uh, um, we, we want to see is it, uh, it will be a ma matter in the future for, for, <clears throat> for local recurrence and survival. So we try to do artery first. In second aspect, why we do artery first. I prefer to do artery first and uh, because the operation is usually many hours, uh, I may check the artery uh, just before finishing, after some hours after, uh, in the end of operation. So, and I may do something something um, with, with it because the, the artery construction in Klaskin tumor is very challenging and demand. And uh, in the second question, uh, th third question uh, about, uh, we use heparin before uh, intraoperatively, before clamping in artery and also in portal vein reconstruction, uh, two, three days after, uh, and then uh, choose the heparin to uh, fraxiparin and noxiparin regime and uh, usually, if we do not use uh, allograft, we um, uh, reject the, the, the anticoagulation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. From my personal experience, I would suggest to use aspirin as well for the uh, uh, particular reconstruction. But uh, so, can we move uh, one question more, please, uh, Silvio? Uh, but uh, Prashant yes, asked. Yes, to, but we have uh, one question to Dennis and one question to Sanjay. Can we do that? Are we allowed? Yes, please. Yes. Okay, Dennis is online or not? I'm live. Yes, my friend, Dennis. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. So, um, first of all, an indication is, uh, so we, we have learned by, from our friend Albert Chan from, uh, from Hong Kong performing ALPS in, uh, for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. He has a limit in performing this in fibrotic fibrosis up to two second, third grade. Do you see any limits in performing living donor rapid for HCC in this regard? So there is, you know, what does it mean performing highly serotic with monstrous hypertension collateral vessel? There's, do you see any, any limits to do that? Or, or every uh, cirrhotic patient with HCC should be able to undergo this or, or should be a sort of pre or highly fibrotic? Where is the limit for you? Well, Silvio, very good question. It's a very smart question. The answer is not easy, I think. Like, you know, these days for ALPS, probably we are, most of the surgeons here who perform ALPS, we are very comfortable with ALPS. We know the good ALPS scenarios and bad ALPS scenarios. And then we have the living donor or deceased donor liver transplantation for colorectal meds come into play. And the, and the borderlines between resectability and transplantability is becoming obscure. So there are patients who can be better off with transplantations. There are patients who are resectable 
but probably should not be rejected. But also, I'm sure when the cases, the number of cases increase, there will be patients that we transplant and go back and say we should have probably pushed rejection for the particular patient. So these lines are blurring. We need well-controlled, modified, uh, well-controlled multi-center studies. This also holds true to hepatocellular carcinoma setting. The patient I showed on the video, uh, actually this April will be two years after rapid procedure, uh, two years after rapid procedure for HCC. We did Milan criteria, no recurrence up to now. So the patient is walking around, she's happy. And uh, we are going to publish, uh, so, sorry, submit the next case these days, the uh, case we uh, wanted to, as a proof of concept, perform the rapid procedure in a patient with MAD score 28, uh, numerous times of hepatic encephalopathy, portal vein thrombosis, and the inflow comes from coronary vein collateral. So this is again, totally different scenario. There's no HCC, but we wanted to uh, we wanted to demonstrate the proof of concept that rapid holds true not only for mild portal hypertension patients, but also for severe portal hypertension patients, and not only the portal hypertension, but also portal vein, complete portal vein thrombosis patients. So I think that when we and the others who are in, in, interested in this procedure develop it to an extent that the applicability and uh, 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 performability will be uh, technically not too much challenging but as a good option. I think the procedure itself has the potential uh, that we surgeons will not reject patients unless and until they have single donor, whether it is blood type compatible or not, we will say, okay, we will do a transplant for you. This is the technical part. The indication part that you are asking will probably, will probably the answers will be depending on the uh, uh, incre increase of, in the number of cases, patient selection uh, in the beginning, uh, starting with beginning with the known criteria, like the criteria we are using, then we should probably extend the criteria after once we uh, can demonstrate the procedure is safe and so on. Where the, where the uh, I know Albert uh, has a phenomenal series and vast experience with HCC resections. To what extent we should do resection and to what extent we should do transplantation in the case of borderline resectability or rapid procedure? I think we, there's time, time to say talk more about this. Thank you so much. Uh, we have to ask the moderator how may, if we can ask another question or not. So, uh, yes, Dr. Hello? Yeah, can I ask a question, uh, Dr. Balsi? Uh, the procedure appeals a lot because you say that uh, the donors, which are usually not possible, can be done. But uh, there are very serious, uh, at least the conceptual questions that I have. And we have to have a, a, a lot of centers doing it to prove that this concept is right. The three issues which I think are, one, you are trying to uh, do a hepatectomy transaction in a cirrhotic liver. Uh, is one. Then you are transplanting the liver and that liver remains in the body with the malignancy for uh, uh, maybe six weeks or whatever time you feel. And the Two, third three thing weeks. is... It's not yeah. six weeks. So there is it's a possibility... Embolization. So there is a possibility of tumor coming in the graft. So that is one. Re resection of a cirrhotic liver with associated bile leak and other problems is another thing. And third thing is you need to give immunosuppression to such patients while the liver with malignancy is still in situ. So technically it is good and it, you've shown that it is possible, but as a concept, uh, will it go on? Will the tumor not recur in the smaller liver apart from the usual problems of regeneration? So these three things, what do you think about it? A short answer, Dr. Dennis, please. Very short answer. These concerns, I would like to uh, say to the uh, owner of the question uh, that all these surgeons are expert surgeons here. All these surgeons know and have the, the same concerns in their mind, including me, but this is not how you develop new procedures. That's my answer. 
ओके थैंक यू आई थैंक ऑल स्पीकर्स फॉर वेरी नाइस डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन एंड फॉर लार्जली कीपिंग ऑन टाइम एंड चेयरपर्सन फॉर ए लाइवली सेशन थैंक यू ऑल वी मूव टू नेक्स्ट सेशन नॉन ट्रांसप्लांट ऑन्कोलॉजी एच पी बी आई इन्वाइट चेयरपर्सन डॉक्टर ओरलांडो ही इज प्रोफेसर एंड चेयरमैन डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जी आई सर्जरी ब्राजील डॉक्टर अनिल अग्रवाल डायरेक्टर प्रोफेसर एंड हेड डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जी आई सर्जरी जी बी पंथ हॉस्पिटल डेली एंड डॉक्टर हितेश चवड़ा ही इज डायरेक्टर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ जी आई सर्जरी एट स्टर्लिंग हॉस्पिटल अहमदाबाद i invite speakers for this session dr eduardo fernandes he is professor department of surgery federal university of rio de janeiro brazil dr eduardo please good morning everybody uh i'm trying to to share my screen and i i I can go through this. Not able to see your screen at present. you need some help yes i think i need a help i i forward the presentation last night so i don't know if we can use it okay we can use that please play recorded session i don't know why it's not working dr eduardo fernandes so we will play your recorded talk you please uh, remain live for any questions voice nahi hai so you can speak we will move your slides okay so let's do that Okay so uh the can i see the slides next slide okay well uh, first of all i want to thank uh uh can you can you go for the first slide please this is a brief introduction uh, yes thanks uh i want to uh, first thank uh, the invitation from my dear friend prashant uh it's a great honor uh to be invited for this very prestige meeting and also to see some very important friends uh, the topic i have today is the extended surgeries for gallbladder cancer with or without new adjuvant chemotherapy uh next. next so this is how i feel uh i am myself with this little cat here and i think the big dogs are the indian surgeons as you know uh uh the gallbladder cancer surgery the mecca of this operation is in india so uh i think it's very difficult to talk uh about gallbladder cancer in the mecca of the gallbladder cancer uh surgery so this is how we we can see uh, the distribution of the the incidence of gallbladder cancer in north india is the higher incidence in the world and our neighbor here in chile also have a high incidence so in brazil Uh, this is uh, not a very common tumor but as a referral center uh, we see cases very often next <clears throat> this is what I, you know we don't have too much time to go through all the details but i want to go before going through uh, the discussion of chemotherapy or not 
we need to understand the basic science of the gallbladder cancer surgery and the principles of the gallbladder cancer surgery that I have seen a lot of surgeons doing not the correct operation for gallbladder cancer surgery. And this is the, how uh, the, 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 the classification of the gallbladder cancer by the Japanese society, that is my favorite uh, uh, stage for the tumor. So we are gonna focus here pretty much on the T3 and T4 tumors. Next. Next, please. So uh, the definitions of advanced gallbladder cancer by definition, the, all the tumors that go in behind the muscle layer are considered advanced gallbladder tumor. So uh, locally advanced is, the definition is not very clear to me. So we see tumors from the fundus of the gallbladder going through the liver like this. This is considered uh, a locally advanced gallbladder tumor. And I don't think if I agree with that because this is a very simple operation that you can see doing uh, a central liver resection. Next. I think the first thing that we need to, to understand is we need to understand histology. So the surgeon need to go uh, to see the, the specimen with the pathologist. So the first thing to do is learn uh, many aspects of the gallbladder histology. So uh, many years ago, you know, uh, based on the learning from the Japanese, especially Professor Miyazaki, I, I said, well, I need to understand and what the pathologist is talking about. I don't know in, in India and the rest of the world, but in Brazil, it's very common to see patients here that they, they already removed the gallbladder and then the pathology is very brief. We don't know much detail. So we need to go back and see uh, uh, with the pathology what is going on of the gallbladder cancer. Next. So this is uh, uh, one of the most important pathologies of the gallbladder cancer in the world from Chile, my friend Juan Carlos Roa. So I have been learning a lot from him. Uh, next. So we need to go through this. Uh, what is, what is, where is the muscular uh, uh, muscle layer of the gallbladder? We need to understand the lamina propria, the tumors that are reaching the, behind the lamina propria. If there is a Hockitansia shaft sinus or not, not, next. And important because in the gallbladder we have uh, basically three sites: the fundus, the body, and 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 the uh, uh, the distal part of the gallbladder, and we have more lamina propria and more uh, elastic fibers on the on the neck of the gallbladder. So the, the tumors going from the neck of the gallbladder, they have more aggressiveness than the tumors going like on the fundus of the gallbladder. Next. This is very important also. The, the liver has a lot of nerves around the hilum. And these tumor cells like cholangiocarcinoma, they love to travel through the nerves. So it's important to understand uh, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nerves around the hilum to see uh, that the surgeon has to clean all these nerves to decrease the recurrence after a curative resection. Next. Next, please. So this is a very important paper. This is one of the most important papers. Please, can you go back, please? So this paper is one of the most important papers. I really recommend you guys to take a look. This is an old paper, but old papers are also very important. Uh, this paper from the Japanese, that they make an important mapping of the lymphatic flow from the gallbladder. And they, this, they they are proposing three uh, lymphatic drainage from the gallbladder. Cholecyst to hetopancreatic way, cholecyst to celiac way, and cholecyst to mesenteric way. This is important because 70% of the lymphatic flow from the gallbladder is going through cholecyst to hetopancreatic way. It means that if you want to do an adequate lymphadenectomy, 
if you only cleaning the nodes around the celiac, the peri artery, you're not doing the correct lymphadenectomy because most of the tumor cells is going to go behind the head of the pancreas to reach the intercave aortic region. So this is very important to, to highlight. Next, please. So uh, based on the Japanese, the Nigata group, a very important group in the study of the gallbladder cancer, they're demonstrating that we need to cockerize the duodenum in every single case to do adequate lymphadenectomy and clear the nodes on the stage 13, 12, and 16. I don't, I don't uh, agree with the fact that if we have positive nodes on the uh, intercave aortic region, the disease is considered systemic. Because if you have a tumor cells on the gallbladder that is already, the, the disease is already on the intercave aortic region, the tumor has uh, uh, passed through the nodes on the stage 12 and 13. So if you have a positive node on, on the 13th stage, it means that the disease is also systemic. Next. So do we have three modes of dissemination going, the tumor going to the liver, the hilum, or to the GI tract. This is uh, the Professor Miyazaki slides. This is very important to, to understand the dissemination of the gallbladder cancer. Next. And this is the Miyazaki classification. We don't have too much time to go through this, but this, I love this classification. Next. So, uh, this is an important paper because uh, why we have to do uh, segment four and five resection? Because this paper from Professor Mazuda is an old paper also showing that the veins that are drained deeply on segment four and five and sometimes segment eight. So if you want to do a, a, a complete radical resection, we need to excise all the potential micrometastasis sites. So it's important to, to understand the anatomic drainage of the gallbladder veins. Next. Like tumor like this, for example, there is a potential chance to have microtumors on the segment eight. So um, central bisection ectomy sometimes. Next. It's important to do a, a R0 resection. Uh, like this. Next. So the question is, why to do chemotherapy? And, and uh, I think the, all the important data so far is coming from India. And uh, here we have one of the worldwide authorities, Professor Anil Agrawal, and uh, a lot of friends from, from Mumbai, and they are running the show. They're telling us what to do. And there is a tendency in the Indian idea, even the Indian middle patch, not to be too much radical and not too, mu too much conservative, uh, that doing chemotherapy before the operation, uh, especially, and we are talking about T3 and T4 tumors, then we can select the patients that's gonna have more benefit from the radical resection. So this uh, paper from 2015, also from Mumbai, uh, they, 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 they uh, made a little bit confused because they mix patients with early gallbladder cancer and advanced gallbladder cancer, but they select 37 patients and they, and they said uh, at the conclusion that the chemotherapy, uh, the new adjuvant chemotherapy provide more survival and from the patients. And we can see here the cumulative survival is pretty acceptable. Next. Again, uh, these, uh, these, this, this Indian uh, paper, this is a phenomenal paper. And I love this, uh, this Tata Memorial Hospital criteria that really recommend you this. We, we are trying to follow this to indicate new adjuvant chemotherapy. We can see here on the left side uh, that, that they are tending to do chemotherapy in every tumor in a TT or T4, or if they are planning to do an aggressive operation or if the nodes are positive uh, or any vascular invasion, they do chemotherapy and they are, they are showing that uh, there is a benefit uh, survival if you compare it with patients with no surgery. This is very clear here. Surgery provides a potential uh, survival in, in about 30, 40% of the patients who underwent new adjuvant chemotherapy. But we have to say that there is any study so this is maybe the, the, the answer for my presentation. There's any study 
uh, any randomized study comparing a new adjuvant versus upfront surgery for gallbladder cancer. Next. So another paper from India showing the same thing. Next. So I'm gonna show you a brief video if we have time. Uh, uh, can you start the video? Okay, so let's 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 uh, uh, let's pass the video. Next, please. So this is our experience with very aggressive operations, the apatopancreatic duodenectomies. Uh, the publication initially was 35 cases. Uh, now we have 47, and as you can see, the most of the indications are from coming from gallbladder cancer. But that was the experience started 15 years ago. Next. And gallbladder cancer is leading uh, the indications. Next. And there's many kinds of uh, uh, combined liver resections, but for gallbladder cancer, uh, most of the cases are segment 4B and 5, or central bisectionectomy, or right trisectionectomies. Next. So we presented this in Ankara uh, uh, two years ago, and, and you know this is uh, our initial year. The mortality was very high, uh, as Professor Bauchi said. Is when you try to develop uh, uh, techniques, you pay a price for this, and we pay a high uh, price for this to learn this technique. This is not easy to learn. HPD is a very complex. There's too much uh, things to learn. And important thing to say is like India and Brazil, uh, I work in the private on the public side. On the public side here in Brazil, sometimes we have difficulties to do uh, the best treatment. Uh, chemotherapy maybe takes uh, longer to start and it's different from the private. So uh, sometimes the only option we have is upfront surgery for patients from coming from the public side. And this is what we have. And it's getting even worse right now on the COVID era. Next, please. So this is, uh, no, we have long-term survival of these operations. You can see this is a patient's now uh, 14 years survival from a gallbladder cancer, HPD, but the guy had the uh, uh, gallbladder cancer on the left side. So the tumor developed on pretty much on uh, invading the left side of the liver. So we did a, a left trisection action with the PD and the patient is still alive. Next. A few other examples of radical resections with long-term survivals on gallbladder cancer. Uh, next. So in summary, uh, what I wanna say is we need to individualize patients. Every patient is different. Doing chemo in every case, it depends. In my practice, if the patient is coming on the private, on the public, uh, if the tumor is T3 and T4, we try to follow the, ta the Tata uh, Memorial Hospital criteria. Doing new adjuvant is always better. I'm, I have no doubt about it. If you are planning an aggressive operation, chemo will select the tumor. And this is aggressive tumor. You know? Can you go back this two seconds, please? And R0 is mandatory. If you want to do aggressive operation, R0 is the goal. Don't makes no sense to leave the tumor, any, any, any tumor or any node. Dissection of the lymph nodes, it's very important. New adjuvant chemotherapy to select, as I said. And locally advanced, the definition is not very clear yet. And I think uh, uh, we should operate the patients and not, never give up. HPD is an important weapon in selected patients, and, and we need to have expertise in liver transplantation, vascular reconstructions, and experience in the managing of the complex cases. Next. So uh, this is Professor Miyazaki, where I learned a lot in Japan when I spent a couple months with him. Next. And this is uh, my friends, uh, one of the most important uh, surgeons in, in India, Professor 
a new, my friend, and I learned a lot. I visited him in, in Delhi, Professor Orlando Torres, a reference of liver surgery in Brazil, and many other fancy friends that are here, Professor Bauchi, uh, uh, Professor uh, Orlando, Ruslan, and Ashishi, and uh, Prashan. Thank you very much for the privilege to be here with you guys. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. I invite Dr. Mohammad Rela. He is chairman and director of Dr. Rela Institute and Medical Center, Chennai. Sir. Hello. Hi, yes. good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I hope I don't have problem uh, sharing my slide. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Prashant and um, Avi for giving me this opportunity. Um, can you see my slide now? Yes, sir, we can see. Um, yeah. Now, um, I mean, the title of this session is um, uh, non-transplant HPV, I thought, but um, the, my, the title given to me is R0 resection and liver transplantation for locally advanced um, uh, cholangiocarcinoma. I'll get right to my talk. Um, you, there are many, many specialists here who have huge experience. So I'd like to excuse if uh, um, they feel that um, this is a little basic, but um, we are also really uh, talking to a lot of um, junior surgeons. Now, we all know it's a slow growing tumor. Um, there is a proximity to major inflow at the hilum. Um, the pathology of these tumors um, is important. Uh, they have a severe desmoplastic reaction, which results in a lot of vascular um, involvement. There is poor response to chemotherapy, and R zero resection provides the best chance of a cure. Now, just to go into a little anatomy, um, I always talk about this, uh, which determines really how we deal with. And here you see the the operative picture is after. Um, a hyla mass has been removed with um, the right and left duct, which is the superior most. Um, so the bifurcation of the bile duct is the highest in the hilum. Uh, and below that is the bifurcation of uh, the portal vein. Um, and below that is the bifurcation of the artery. And there is also a left to right move. The bifurcation of the bile duct, as you all know, is uh, the, in, in, the, in the right free border, the lesser momentum, the bile duct is the rightmost structure. So this anatomy has got some implications because um, the portal vein is the most close to the hyla mass and therefore is more commonly involved than the artery. Uh, when it comes to the artery, the right artery is more commonly involved than the left hepatic artery because the division of the left hepatic artery is very, very um, away from the hilum. It's much lower and then it separates off and uh, moves away into the left side of um, the hilum. So most often the left hepatic artery escapes. Um, this has got implications again, when you when there is a vascular invasion, uh, resecting the portal vein uh, is more straightforward for most people. But um, I think there is more and more resections of arteries being performed. So if you have if you're planning for a right hepatic resection, right, right or an extended right hepatectomy, Arterial resection is not a problem because uh, the, if the right artery is involved, you're going to be removing the right artery um, and the portal bifurcation and going to do an end-to-end -end portal vein anastomosis. The problem comes when there is a contralateral artery involved. That's more common when you're planning a left-sided resection because when you plan a left-sided left resection, if the hyla mass is involved in the right hepatic artery, then you also have to have a right, hat, a right hepatic artery resection and anastomosis. So there is a difference when you plan a right uh, resection versus a left resection. And uh, that entirely is because of the anatomy of the protohepatis. And you can see here in the second CT scan how the artery is running behind the um, bile duct, which is uh, looking very vascularized. Now, the R0 resection is uh, determined by really two important factors. You know the bismuth classification, the longitudinal tumor extent, whether it's um, uh, the second order involved or the first order involved, uh, and then the circumferential involvement. Um, now, the, the longitudinal extent, obviously, into the right side or the left side will decide whether you want to do a right side or a left side hepatectomy. 
The circumferential involvement will decide on really the importance of um, infiltration of the caudate lobe of the liver and resection of the caudate lobe, as well as the vascular involvement are determined by these. I think most other really are uh, sensible things, anatomical variations, and future remnant might determine sometimes whether you want to do a right hepatectomy or a left hepatectomy. And there has been really a huge um, improvement in the thought process in the surgical resections for hyalocholangiocarcinoma, starting with really palliative uh, procedures to local resection of bile duct alone to major resections. And now I think there is a huge interest in liver transplantation for uh, unresectable cholangiocarcinoma. But if you look at the history really, um, it's, it's, I find it very interesting that even when you look at the 1970s to 2010, the resectability rate has not changed hugely for hyalocholangio. So there have been very good um, uh, technical surgeon over many years, but what has changed now is the extent of resectability is what changed. The type of hepatectomy has obviously changed. The, the resections have been more aggressive. And, uh, and really the portal vein resection has not changed, even though there is a gentle increase in the percentage of portal vein resections to almost 40%, but there is definitely an interest in increasing arterial resections to almost 20%. And as, as I told you, not all patients will require arterial resection. And the East have been much more aggressive than the West in the early phase. I think it may not be the case any longer. Um, in the earlier reports, you will see that um, the outcome of um, the cholangiocarcinoma resection was slightly better in the Eastern countries compared to the West. And that is attributed to really the addition of the caudate lobectomy in um, cholangio resections in the East, which was introduced by really the Japanese surgeons, almost 90% caudate lobectomy versus 8%. And that shows in the difference in mortality. And that's been published many times now that the caudate resection is essential for improving resectability. It's R0 resection for cholangio. Uh, when you talk about um, type 1 and type 2 tumors, um, there is, it's always like in the, in the, in the x-ray that you see in the ERCP, it's always very tempting to do a local resection. And uh, really very earlier on, Peter and I have published that um, if you do a local resection of bile duct alone and do a hepatic jejunostomy, you almost lost all the patients within five years. I mean, these are the patients you expect to do well, but they do very badly with local resection. And the recommendation really is, even for type one and type two hyalocholangiocarcinoma, you have to add a right hepatectomy unless it's a papillary tumor where you can actually do a local excision. Now coming to um, R0 resection for uh, type 3 and type 4 cholangiocarcinoma. I mean, these patients require extensive surgery. There is a, if you see the first picture, there is a very dense um, um, uh, sclerous uh, reaction, which actually pulls on the portal vein. Um, the whitish tissue that you see on the portal vein is a potentially malignancy, really. I mean, this is not a no-touch technique, and I don't think one should be dissecting so, so much in the hyalur region in order to protect the portal vein or in order to avoid, because radiologically, you might have thought that the left portal vein is completely intact and the right portal vein is narrowed down. But if, uh, one needs to be very careful about um, how much dissection is done at the hyalur. Now, this is the point I was saying, when you're planning a, a left-sided resection, uh, when you're planning a right-sided resection, it is, it is very simple because the right artery is involved. You're going to take the right artery and then resect the portal vein. When you're doing a left-sided resection, quite often by the, the skittish nature of the tumor, the right artery can get pulled up into the tumor and it, it may invariably require a, a right arterial resection and anastomosis in left-sided resection in order to get a... Um, R0 resection. Now, I, I use this slide to, to demonstrate to people, and here, if you see Pete and I house series, uh, where these are outcomes of vascular resections in cholangiocarcinoma, and he has produced a five-year survival of 65%. I mean, the numbers are small. And when you look at it, he's got histologically proven vascular invasion was only 20, 12%. 
Um, and uh, you might be asking, or oh, maybe he's doing early cases. Um, uh, he's resecting uh, vessels when they're not involved. I would uh, put it the other way around. I would I like to put it the way that whenever you think that there is a potential for vascular invasion, you go for a no-touch technique and resect the vessels rather than try and dissect to see when they are involved. And that probably is why he's got a better survival than the others who have had a much, much lower incidence of vascular resection you can see, but much worse survival in these patients. Now, I think um, uh, the arterial resection has been controversial earlier on, but I think there is uh, no more controversy about the benefits of um, arterial resections. And uh, I mean, we can talk about it. There is a difference between pancreatic cancer and here where in pancreatic cancer, arterial resections have not proven to be uh, much better. And there are anatomical reasons for that, whereas in cholangiocarcinomas, so the results of arterial resections have been good. Now, but the, there is a difference between, um, um, the, in terms of um, R0 resections, there is a difference between a right hepatectomy and a left hepatectomy. You're more likely to get um, uh, an oncologically clear uh, resection in an extended right or a right hepatectomy than in the left hepatectomy for the reason I said that the vascular, contralateral vascular involvement is common in the left left hepatectomies. And there is also um, the, the ease at which you can perform a right hepatectomy because the left portal vein is longer and easier to resect an anastomose. The left hepatic artery is away from the hilum and also the left bile ducts are much easier uh, to anastomose than multiple landing up with multiple ducts on the right side. So technically, extended right hepatectomy provides you with better uh, oncological um, um, result. Whereas if you've got a cholestatic liver or if there is sepsis that you can't clear completely, um, the early post-operative results are much better with the left epitectomy because the remnant volume is much better with the left epitectomy. So you might uh, choose, a, if, if, both, if both was possible in a, in a type 4 cholangio, if the patient's not completely cleared the jaundice or if you feel that the liver doesn't feel entirely normal, it may be better to do uh, a left rather than right. Now, coming to the, the resection status um, and the outcome, you have to have a negative margin, both on the duct side and on the specimen side to get the best outcome. Uh, if you got a negative margin on the anastomotic side, on the duct side, and a positive margin on the right side, even though you may feel that you have done the anastomosis to a clear duct margin, um, the outcome is actually not much different from having a positive margin of the anastomosis. And you can see the result here. Only the outcome is only better when both sides are negative, not with one side. Um, now, um, the, the no-touch technique is something um, uh, we talked about earlier on that Peter Nyhaus uh, promoted and um, resulted in more vascular resections which were actually histologically negative, but better outcome. And uh, we have also described a technique of no touch where this is always an extended right hepatectomy where you mobilize the um, uh, portal vein at the Rex recess and put a jump craft um, uh, between the um, sup suprapancreatic portal vein. And um, you will see this, this is published actually. So you mobilize it and, and then you do a portal anastomosis first. As I said, the left hepatic artery is uh, usually never involved and your resection margin here becomes far to the left compared to if you had to do a standard extended right hepatectomy. Um, in the eight years, this is um, the earlier series. In the last two years, we've probably done about another about 12 or 13 um, uh, cholangio resections. Uh, if you look at, um, I mean, most of the cases which are referred are probably referred to us because um, um, they probably require vascular resections or arterial resections. Um, the, the proportion of right epitectomy and left epitectomy is almost equal. Um, and the proportion of portal vein resection uh, is probably slightly higher on the left epitectomy. But when you look at the arterial resection, the right epitectomies uh, don't have arterial resections, whereas a high proportion of the left epitectomy have arterial resection. 23% of the overall series, but if you look at 50%, of the left epitectomies have had arterial resections. And the outcome of right, right side of resection versus left side of resection, the right sided resections have got a better survival than the left. As I said, it's oncologically superior operation than a left sided resection. 
Uh, but still, I think um, the five-year survival, this is uh, published in 2016. The number's not exactly the same as the, the previous numbers I've quoted. Nevertheless, the outcome is not really that bad for cholangio. Now, coming to transplantation, just a few words. Uh, so there has been an increasing interest in um, transplantation for uh, cholangiocarcinoma, but I think the take up has been slower than I expected. Uh, and and if, if, when I look at my own practice, I hardly see patients who are really the right patients for transplantation. Most of them, um, there is a possibility of resection. So there is always this, um, uh, the ethos of the unit and what one considers resectable and not resectable. All of these are very difficult to really quantify from one unit to the other. And when you look at the early series uh, from Cincinnati, without any new adjuvant chemotherapy, already the outcome was not too bad at all. One, two, and five year survival with 72, 48, and 23. I think you should ignore the one year survival uh, completely, really. One year survival doesn't make any sense because whether you do resection or transplantation, most patients will survive one year. So the two and five year survival of 50 and 23%. And then Mayo came with a very strict protocol and, uh, um, and, and they got good results, but um, you would expect that. They are talking about um, a tumor size of less than three centimeters uh, with no lymph node involvement, you have to do a laparoscopy with that um, hand guided uh, to get a negative lymph node. Uh, and then they go through the chemo radiotherapy and then a brachytherapy and then have a transplant. And the advanced cases will have a dropout as well. Um, and then not surprisingly, you get an outstanding result. Um, for transplantation. So that there is a definite role. I'm not saying there is absolutely a clear role for transplantation. If I have to have a, a good survival for cholangio, I would choose this if I was suitable within the Mayo uh, protocol with um, a three year and a five year survival of 82% and 82%. I think when you analyze this data, I think they've had a subsequent publication. When you analyze the data, if you can, I don't know, I can't, there's an overlap on my and my D. If you see the second graph, if you take out the PSCs from the cholangio transplantation, the results are not looking as good because PSCs should not be, PSC cholangio should not be taken as the same as very high cholangiocarcinoma because these are not the patients we are talking about. We can't compare resections versus transplantation for these patients. When you take, and, and also they're all on a screening program and then you diagnose small, small uh, cholangio and then, or you have a dominant stricture and then you go for a transplant. And so I, I think that confuses it, that has to be taken out. And fortunately they've published taking it out. And now you see that the five year survival has dropped down to from 78, or was it, um, what was the previous, somewhere around 78%, it's dropped down to 55%. Because I want you to remember this uh, figure of the best results of about 55% for five-year survival. And the multicenter study also from the United States quotes a 65% survival. And I believe that there's going to be a lot of PSC cholangios in it. So you need to take that out really for a comparison of true um, results of cholangio um, um, for transplantation for cholangio. Why I'm saying this is now comes a discussion which is pushing the boundaries, pushing the envelope, and automatically people are going to be saying, if the results of transplantation is so good compared to resection, why are we doing resection? Shouldn't we be including these patients for transplantation as a question comes? And uh, such arguments and people would always use the best outcome of really transplantation would probably an average or below average outcome of resection because there are good surgeons with good outcome for cholangio with 40 to 50% five year survival for cholangio. So if you put it this way, 64% versus 18% and actually the resection, the transplant patients are actually slightly unresectable cases as well. Why are we doing resections at all? I think it's, it's important and Rosen himself, gives, this is my last slide, Charles Rosen himself gives, gives an idea, you cannot do it like that because outcome of transplantation for end stage liver disease is at five years, these patients have no option of surviving and you're expecting a 50% survival. Whereas here, the resection potentially gives them 30 to 40% survival at five years. 
transplantation gives 60% survival, the difference in the survival is probably only around 15 to 20%. And therefore, I don't believe, or even Charles doesn't believe that there is time yet to say that all patients with cholangio should have a resection. I think I stopped there. Thank you very much, and I'll take questions. Thank you, sir. I invite chairpersons to start discussion. Uh, thanks, Dr. Ella. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, I'll, I have a question for you. For uh, left-sided resections for hydrocholangiocarcinoma, uh, do you do volume augmentation? And, and when do you do PTBD uh, before resection? If the remnant volume is adequate, I will not do PTBD. But um, we heard uh, the previous speaker say uh, uh, earlier on, a lot of these patients have already had a PTBD or have had a stentin. But once they have had an intervention into the biliary system, I will not touch them until the bilirubins drop to less than three. Whereas on the right-hand side, for an extended right resection, I would like to normalize the bilirubin. Whereas for a left-sided resection, um, I usually will not do a PTBD um, if the bilirubin is less than 10, because there is enough remnant and they rapidly drop. Introducing infection into the system is a problem. But once they have had an intervention of the biliary tree, you need to wait until the bilirubin falls completely. And, and, and for, for transplant for uh, hyalurocholangiocarcinoma, uh, uh, when do you think that uh, the staging laparoscopy or laparotomy should be done? I mean, what's the ideal timing of doing it? I, I have not. I have not done it. If I was doing a, if I was doing a living donor liver transplant, I would probably do it a day before, or two days before. But the problem is, a lot of these centers, um, the Western centers, are doing um, a disease donor liver transplant. So the timing of uh, the staging laparoscopy is quite difficult. Yeah. I mean, I, I still believe that um, the transplants with such strict criteria, uh, the Mayo criteria, a lot of those patients potentially, other than the PSC, potentially are resectable because a lot of the resection results are in patients who have who land up with positive lymphatics and lymph node positive patients we are talking about. Whereas the patients selected for transplantations are node negative. So you would expect better results. It's not thinking the other way around. I thank both speakers for great talks and clear message and chairpersons for this uh, lively session. Thank you all. We move to next session. It is very interesting session of hepatology and intervention radiology sessions. I invite chairpersons, Dr. Sanjay Bajal. He is leading intervention radiologist in India, Dr. Alok Mishra, a uh, senior consultant hepatologist from Allahabad. Dr. Sumana, she is senior surgeon at AIG Hyderabad, and Dr. Abhay Kapoor, senior consultant intervention radiology, Medanta. I invite speakers, Dr. D.B. Moon, intraoperative portogram with shunt embolization during LDLT. Dr. Moon. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Thank you. And congratulations for 3,000 LDLT at Medanta Hospital. Total flow insufficiency may result in poor LDLT outcome, and securing the adequate total inflow is utmost important for a technically successful LDLT. We may encounter four typical portosystemic collateral. Coronary collaterals comprise 53% and spinal renal shunt comprise 38% in our series. Even though the proportion is small, inferior mesenteric vein and superior mesenteric vein collaterals are often present and we also take care of them because we are prone to ignore. We 
In case of big portosystemic collateral patients, we should keep in mind that portal vein thrombosis or stenosis is commonly accompanied. Portal vein thrombectomy or proxy is required to secure active portal inflow. This is unforgettable bitter experience of portal prostin at LDRT. 13 years ago, the patient received left low graft Functionally, small for size graft due to accidental injury of segment 4 hepatic vein. Post of eight days, ASD and ALT rose to over 10,000, and we checked hepatic angiogram and revealed no hepatic artery thrombosis. At that time, indirect SME protogram showed large portochestemic collateral through inferior mesenteric vein, but we ignored. CT scan showed infraction of the graph. We lost our precious patient due to the ignorance of porofluorosteel. This is another porofluorosteel cases show delayed graph function. He received modified rhinograph urgently due to acute on chronic liver failure. Intraoperatively, we perform collateral ligation. However, postoperatively, total bilirubin persistently elevated over 60 milligrams. On post of 22nd days, we found portal steel through the remaining splenorenal renal shunt. As a management, we performed laparotomy and additional collateral interruption on the guidance of intraportogram. Thereafter, portal bilirubin slowly decreased to normal range. Pictures on the bottom are the completion view of intraportogram and follow CT scan. It revealed disappearance of portal systemic collateral. These two cases suggested that complete interruption of large portal systemic collateral is important for graph service procedure in LDRT by avoidance of portal prostate. This picture is showing left renal vein ligation for interruption of splenorenal renal shunt. Left Ligation is the final cause of splenorenal renal shunt, and ligation of left renal vein is simple and feasible method during liver transplantation. However, large splenorenal renal shunt often drain into not only left renal vein but also left coronal vein. In this particular situation, left renal vein ligation is not the answer to interrupt collateral. So we perform direct interruption of splenorenal renal shunt in those cases. Left picture shows splenorenal renal shunt, left renal vein, and left coronal vein clearly. Right picture shows directly ligated splenorenal renal shunt. In case of large coronary vein, it can be interrupted by dissection and isolation of coronary vein only, such as left picture or alternatively by mass ligation of gastric less curvature. This picture shows the isolated gastric less curvature, including large coronary vein. Intraprotogram can be performed via inferior mesenteric vein or superior mesenteric vein tributaries by using selling a technique on the protoscope. During intraportogram, we should obtain two types of portogram according to the location of catheter teeth, SMB portogram and splenic vein portogram, in order to visualize the whole splenic venous flow. Intraportogram can precisely visualize the significant portosystemic collateral, and we can monitor the completeness of collateral interruption. In addition, we can treat unrelieved portal vein thrombosis or stenosis and remaining portal systemic collaterals by portal vein stenting or coil embolization. This is a good case showing the role of intraportogram even after portal vein thrombectomy and venoplasty. You can see unrelieved portal vein stenosis, particularly at intrapancreatic portion and persistent portal flow still on intraportogram which may result in portal flow insufficiency under the guidance of intraportogram, we can reverse it to normal hemodynamics by surgical ligation and portal vein stand with additional ballooning. 
Here are two patients who underwent major hepatectomy previously and surgical interruption could not be performed. Uninterrupted large collateral such as coronary and splenorenal shunt could be effectively interrupted by embolization during intraportogra. This patient had large corticosystemic shunt originating from SMB and running behind pancreas and finally drained into azigos vein. On intraportogram, after engraftment, you can see huge SMB collaterals. We perform coil embolization first and finished with additional glue embolization. Final SMB and splenic vein protogram showed absence of portal steel. Post of seven days CT scan revealed thrombosed collateral vein with low density. This patient had complete portal vein thrombosis to the splenomesentric junction with deep splenorenal shunt draining into left renal vein and paravertebral collaterals. Preoperatively, we planned portal vein thrombectomy and left renal vein ligation and intraportogram on the preparation for the renal portal anastomosis in advance. Splenic vein devascularization was planned due to less than 1% GRW and splenomegaly. We perform modified rhinograft implantation and then left renal vein ligation after portal vein thrombectomy. SMB protogram revealed successfully removed portal vein thrombus, but some of SMB flow diverted to splenic vein, which is indirect evidence of portal steel. Splenic vein protogram showed persistent portal steel through the splenorenal shunt despite the sluggish flow. We changed the plan from left renal vein ligation to splenic vein embolization using plug and glue. As a result, left renal vein was untied. Final protogram showed we established normal hemodynamics without chloroprol steel. When you look at the in hospital mortality in adult LDLT, in 2003, at the time of initiation of intraprotogram, 6% mortality was recorded and portal vein thrombosis or stenosis comprised 9%. In 2015, in hospital mortality was just 1.2%, although the proportion of portal vein thrombosis or stenosis patients increased to 24%. As a conclusion, antiporal info is essential for successful LDRT. Post LDRT portal flow still may result in lethal outcome, hence, large pre existing portal systemic shunt should be interrupted. Surgical interruption is primary management. However, it is often incomplete and inapplicable. As a result, intraprotogram and additional embolization when necessary is an essential and final maneuver to secure the adequate portal inflow for the partial liver graft. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Moon. I am Dr. Narendra. We'll present endoscopic ultrasound guided FNA from difficult lymph nodes. We will have questions at the end of this session. So why FNA of lymph nodes? If we demonstrate that lymph nodes are metastatic in a case of HCC, it rules out liver transplantation. Not all nodes are metastatic. Sometimes there is coexistent tuberculosis. We need to treat that before transplantation. But FNA from abdominal lymph node is often difficult due to small size, presence of collaterals in patients with cirrhosis and difficult anatomic location. So endoscopic ultrasound, it overcomes certain limitations of traditional percutaneous methods. Like it is real time monitoring, it is proximity to target lymph nodes, we can avoid collaterals and just some sedation is needed, it is minimally invasive. So case one, he had HCC, and there is a small lymph node in front of esophagus. It is very difficult to get by percutaneous means. So we can see this lymph node is very near to right atrium. 
This is a black lymph node with sharply defined borders, approximately one centimeter in size. So in cases of malignancy, if we see such morphological features, these lymph nodes are almost always malignant. Because of real-time monitoring of procedure, this is FNA needle. And FNA can be done easily and from different parts of lymph node, even in a small lymph node. So this lymph node was malignant and a transplantation could be avoided. So lymph nodes near hepatic artery and portal vein, we can see a FDG avid lymph node here. This is some venous collateral. Again, at very difficult location. This is subcentimetric lymph node. So this is EUS probe, it is 14 mm. When you want to compare size of target lesion, this is portal vein, hepatic artery, liver surface, FNA needle. So in presence of, uh, because we are not overshooting target structure, we are doing, doing the procedure always vision guided so we can avoid puncture of vessels. So again, this lymph node is quite hypoechoic, almost round in shape. This was malignant in nature. Portocaval lymph nodes. This is portal vein, IVC. We can see a oblong lymph node here. This is IVC, liver parenchyma, our needle. So this is needle inside lymph node. Hypoechoic lymph nodes are mostly malignant lymph nodes, but sometimes we found tuberculosis also. So it is always advisable to do FNA rather than labeling as malignant without FNA. Aorta. And IVC. So there is a lymph node here. It is not so hypoechoic as compared to earlier lymph nodes and also it is oblong in shape, but it is six to seven millimeter only at short axis. So again, FNA can be done easily because it is very proximal to duodenum. It was a reactive lymph node and patient was taken up for transplantation. Transvascular FNAs are generally not advisable so this is duodenum, IVC, aorta, and a lymph node here. But this lymph node is significant in size. Patient had HCC, child's A, no coagulopathy. So this is EUS image, IVC, aorta, and a almost round lymph node, more than one centimeter in size. After explaining patient, so EUS guided FNA was done. We can see faint shadow of needle because this is 25G needle. Only one pass was made. This lymph node was malignant and transplantation was not done. Lymph nodes near celiac axis because celiac axis is very close to posterior gastric wall. So FNA can be done from lymph nodes at celiac axis also. Now this is AP window, high in mediastinum. This is pulmonary artery, aorta, we can see a lymph node and we can see a small speck of calcification here. <clears throat> we are on this side of calcification at present. Then we change our side by elevator or up down knob. We are at level of calcification now and we are away from this calcification. So even in subcentimetric lymph nodes, we can take sample from different parts of lymph node. This was tubercular lymph node. So I have taken a case of left adrenal also because of multiple collaterals, it is difficult to take sample from a left adrenal. 25G needle was used. It was metastatic adrenal enlargement. We published our experience of USFN in patients with HCC and in patients with fever of unknown origin, 50 patients with HCC. So metastasis was there in 30%. These were not taken up for transplantation. 8% of patients had tubercular lymphadenitis and they were treated before transplantation. So I conclude EUS is quite accurate. It is very safe. 
Inadequate samples are quite uncommon and US FNA of lymph nodes in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, it significantly impacts management. Thanks. For next talk, I invite Dr. Amar Mukund. He is additional professor, intervention, radiology, Institute of liver and biliary sciences, Delhi. Dr. Amar. Uh, hello. Huh. Thank you so much. And uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Okay, Dr. Narendra. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I thank Dr. Prashant and Dr. Cohen's uh, team for having me here. So with this, I'll quickly start my presentation. So uh, I've been asked to talk about right hepatic vein stenting in post liver transplant setting. So hepatic vein, hepatic vein stenosis in post transplant setting is not very common, but yes, we do uh, see such cases. And uh, I'll be sharing uh, one of such cases which we did and what are the take home message for such kind of scenario in post transplant setting. So it is a 36 year old male who was uh, 14 month post uh, live donor liver transplantation with a right lobe graft. And he presented with continued abdominal discomfort and uh, persistently raised liver enzymes, including AST, ALT, uh, serum alkaline phosphatase and GGT. On Doppler examination, he had a biphasic flow and uh, uh, it was not, you know, very uh, uh, conclusive to call a HVOTO in that particular scan. And portal vein and hepatic artery were normal. The fibro scan, the liver stiffness measurement was 25 kPa and patient was planned for hepatic venogram, HVPG and TGLB. So we started with, yeah. So we started with uh, IVC gram. This is how we evaluate any of the TGLB in post-transplant setting. We need to see the uh, IVC. So IVC here appears absolutely normal. Then we move to then we move to hepatic vein and you can see there is the hepatic vein. If you see carefully, there is some congestion. Although my catheter is deep inside the hepatic vein, you may see this congestion. So this may be, you know, just because of pressure with which contrast is injected. However, if you see here, there is some narrowing, although it is not very clear, but you can see there is some narrowing, some waste over here. And then we measured the pressure. This is the pressure values, the hepatic vein, which had a pressure of 24 millimeter of mercury. The IVC had 55 millimeter of mercury. So the gradient across hepatic vein and IVC, that is across an ostomosis, it was 19 millimeter of mercury. Whereas RA was, uh, right atrium was four millimeter of mercury. So gradient across hepatic vein and right atrium was 20 millimeter of mercury. So based on these uh, findings of pressures, uh, angioplasty was, uh, thought of and angioplasty was done in this particular case. So we started with a 10 millimeter balloon and we went up to 12 millimeter balloon. So here you can see this is the waste, which is the anastomotic site. And here uh, it was uh, finally the balloon was inflated using an inflation device and this waste was gone. Here you can see the uh, balloon is nicely inflated, no waste seen. So we've uh, did a venogram thereafter, although the venogram looks very similar to what we saw previously, but if you see the congestion part, so here congestion is slightly removed because the catheter is at the same position from where we did a venogram uh, in the previous, uh, uh, previous, in a prior work. So post angioplasty, we again measured the pressures and the pressures came down drastically. So the hepatic vein, came down from 24 to 11 and IVC went up from five to seven. So the gradient across hepatic vein and IVC was reduced to four. So normally we consider a, a from three to five as equivocal and we ju just don't treat such cases. So in this particular case, stenting was not done because we thought that the pressure was adequately reduced in this particular case. And we did a fibro scan also the, on the very next day and the LSM reduced from 25 kPa to 12 kPa. So again, there was a significant dis, uh, uh, reduction in the fibroscan value. Then the patient was absolutely fine. He was following up every six months to our place. 
however again in may 2019 because it was uh, in 2017 when he presented so after about a, about 2 years he again presented with abdominal discomfort and distension for last 6 months and there was elevated enzymes and fibro scan which was which came down to 12 was again uh, 18 kpa so a liver biopsy was done percutaneous liver biopsy and again we were uh, surprised to see that it was showing chronic hvo tube so we again started with uh, hepatic venogram more or less a very normal looking venogram so if you see this venogram if you just go by the visual appearance it looks very normal i don't know why it's not moving okay fine so then we measured the pressure across the hepatic vein so the hepatic vein was 18 mm mercury whereas the ivc was 1 mm of mercury and the gradient across hepatic vein and ivc was 17 so again we found that the pressure gradient which was reduced to 4 rose to 17 in the, in 2 years so we again we went and did a angioplasty and we placed a stent and this is a 14 mm stent at 4 cm in length so this is a 4 cm length and the diameter is 14 mm and then we did a post stenting dilatation as well you can see the stent has already been placed the balloon is being used for dilatation of the stent so that it opens completely and then we did a venogram so a very nice flow has been seen and if you see the catheter is almost at the distal end of the hepatic vein but there is no congestion over here so it is nicely draining and uh, again we uh, sorry so this was the pressure gradient what we measured so hepatic vein was 4 so suddenly it came down from 18 to 4 and ivc was 2 so it rose from 1 to 2 so now the pressure gradient across ivc and hepatic vein was was 2 and uh, across hepatic vein and ra was 3 so it is absolutely normal this is what we expect and we see in any normal individual then we did the fibro scan the fibro scan after 1 month the liver stiffness me measurement was 11 kpa which came down from 18 to 11 and similarly the lsm after 3 months was 8 kpa so you it further reduced after 3 months of follow up so this is important to note that the primary it is the uh, hvoto in case of uh, post transplant patients is not similar to primary bud carry so the findings is entirely different the post liver transplant hepatic vein stenosis may be missed on ultrasound in cases of partial stenosis as most of the cases would have a partial stenosis and if you go and you don't suspect it and don't tell your uh, fellow radiologist most of the time if he says that it is biphasic to triphasic or it is triphasic most of us would agree that okay it is a normal flow but if it is a just a, a, a mild derangement of liver enzymes mildly elevated and everything else has been ruled out then probably you need to do a biopsy or at least a biopsy along with Uh, hvpg and that will give you an answer so hepatic venogram with pressure studies is mandatory in cases of suspicion to establish or rule out hepatic vein vein stenosis in post liver transplant setting and uh, although uh, because uh, hepatic vein complications are not very common but amongst uh, 12 to 13 cases which we would have done in last 10 years i find that this is the most important thing we rarely see a frank complete occlusion of hepatic vein in post transplant setting most of the times hepatic vein is patent but there is some stenosis and even a partial stenosis actually has a uh, leads to derangement in enzymes and sometimes leads to formation of ascites thank you for your patient hearing thank you dr amar we will have questions at the end i invite dr rohit khandelwal he is consultant at intervention radiology medanta the medicity dr rohit please Uh, good evening everyone thank you organizing committee for inviting me giving a video lecture on a case of the pre transplantation portal vein recanalization and tips creation for chronic portal vein thrombosis to prepare portal vein for liver transplant so uh, case was a 4 years 9 month old female child she has chronic chronic liver disease due to glycogen storage disease and she had chronic portal vein and splenic vein thrombosis history of recurrent pancreatitis on biopsy there was advanced fibrosis and plan for the liver transplant 
how are view of the main portal vein thrombosis and uh, splenic vein thrombosis physiologic, physiological anastomosis of problem uh, some technical problem sorry for minute Right. So it okay. Now it's working. So uh, sewage plant for liver transplant. However, in view of the main portal vein thrombosis, physiological anastomosis of portal vein is not possible. So case was discussed in MDT and planned for the recanalization of the portal vein. So this is the case. Video presentation of the case. Uh, this is the axial CT scan image of the patient showing liver is enlarged in size. There is no defined portal vein is seen and multiple collaterals are noted at the liver hilum. These are the MIP images showing the attenuated central portal veins and multiple collateral formation at the hilum. Uh, this is the coronal image showing the similar finding. There is a thrombosis of the proximal SMB, grossly attenuated retropancreatic splenic vein and cavernum of formation at the hilum. Uh, this is the ultrasound image showing the there is no defined vein seen in the med at the hilum. There are multiple collateral seen in place of the main portal vein. So patient was taken for the portal vein recanalization. Under ultrasound guided segment six portal vein branch was punctured and access was secured. Photogram was taken between swing patent intrahepatic portal vein. However, they are attenuated using the guide word character combination. Distal splenic cannulation was done and splenic Venogram was taken, which is showing multiple collateral formation and chronically thrombosis retropancreatic splenic vein. Now, SMB venogram was taken, which is showing thrombosis of the proximal SMB and multiple collateral formation in its place of defined portal vein. And these collateral provide intrahepatic portal flow. So, balloon character was used to do venoplasty of the retropancreatic splenic vein, proximal SMB and main portal vein. Uh, this is the final venogram after post venoplasty. There is a partial recanalization of seen the main portal vein, splenic vein and SMB. However, significant collateral arts is still present. We plan tips at this time to provide adequate outflow to restabilize portal flow and maintain potency of the SP axis. So we take we to write IGBSS and place uh, tips cannula. Uh, this is the tips cannula in the liver pen gamma. Balloon catheter was placed in the portal vein via transhepatic approach as a target for the tips. Uh, balloon was punctured using the cannula. This is the puncture of balloon. And biology retrieved in, through the balloon and access was secured from hepatic vein to portal vein. Uh, trip strike was dilated using the small size balloon. An entire level plan tract was dilated. These are the venogram I taken using the marking pigtail character to assess the size of the stents. We plan to place the tip stent minimally in the main portal vein to provide adequate length of main portal vein for the transplantation. So we placed a covered and graft combination as a tips stent and dilated using the balloons. Stent was placed into a, just proximal in the main portal vein. This is the final venogram, which is showing recanalization of the main portal vein, proximal SMB and splenic vein. Collateral are decreased in the number. However, there is still residual small thrombus seen in the proximal splenic vein and this main portal vein. We hope uh, this tips stent outflow will Dissolve these clots and patient was put on anticoagulants. Transhepatic tips to tract was plugged using the Jorge Alpha and coil combination. This is the ultrasound post procedure. 
So when the defined portal one at the hilum, and these are the pre-processed images when the multiple collateral at the hilum. This is the TIPS monogram taken after one month of the procedures. In this swing, do you, uh, no residual thrombus in the splenic vein and main portal vein, disappearance of the collaterals. Adequate size of the portal vein is not seen. So patients are taken for the transplant. These are the transplant images. Uh, so in the recipient portal vein with this stent in situ, cut were made through the stents and the stent is removed from the proximal end of the portal vein. As the stent was placed one month before, so that was easily re removed by the surgeon. However, edible end was present at that time of the portal vein. This is the post-transplant ultrasound of the graft liver, which is showing this is donor, plate, donor portal vein. This is a recipient portal vein. Recipient portal vein is normal in caliber and well-defined. Uh, these are the CT scan vein post-transplant, which is showing patent spinal portal axis. This is the entire splenic vein, SMB, and there is a good opacification of the intrahepatic portal veins. There is no residual thrombus stenosis noted in the splenic vein. Uh, in literature, there is a large series published in the transplantation. They published pre transplantation, portal vein recanalization, and tips in patients with complete obliterative portal vein thrombosis. They included 44 patients of adult age group. Technical success of the process was 43 out of 44, equal to 98%. And after completion of the procedure, persistent of MPV thrombus in 77% cases, as in our case. However, one month post tips venography, complete resolution of the thrombus in the 76% cases, and out of 44, 36% listed for transplantation. 50% have been transplanted, and at five year MPV patency rate and survival 89%, 82% respectively. No case report is found in pediatric age group in literature. To conclude, in chronic obliterative portal vein thrombosis, pre-transplant pre portal vein recanalization and tips enables physiological and to end anastomosis of portal vein at surgery and obviously need for complex surgical grafts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. I invite chairpersons to start discussion. To begin with, I ask one question to Dr. Moon. Yeah. Dr. Hi. So, I'm Dr. Dr. Moon. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. It is good evening yeah. here. So you yeah. are a very senior surgeon in most experienced LDLT center. Do you think intraportogram has hugely affected graft outcomes? Should we do intraportogram for everyone or it is for selected patients? Uh, we perform intraportogram, not all the patients. Uh, uh, usually preoperatively, uh, we decide uh, who should perform intraportogram. Uh, as a pre-operative -op operative planning, we perform uh, intraportogram uh, selectively. Dr. Sumana, any questions? I have a question to Dr. Moon. Um, yeah. uh, performing the uh, portogram intraoperatively, uh, like for example, when you want, when there's a large shunt, do you look at the portal pressures and then decide whether to close the shunt or you just look at the anatomy and then decide? Yeah. You mean uh, uh, when we perform uh, shunt ligation, uh, possibility of uh, the prob probably uh, poor hypertension, uh, poor hyperperfusion. Yes. So Maybe you worry easy. about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, in our uh, experience, basically we uh, should uh, we perform uh, uh, we make a wide outflow, and uh, as possible as we can, we should meet. Uh, uh, GRWR above uh, zero point eight percent. Usually, try to meet one uh, percent. Under that under that situation, surgical in interruption, 
uh, at the surgical interruption, we checked the uh, uh, por porabin pressure several times. No, the pressure is usually less than, just less than 15 millimilli mercury. Uh, but sometimes, uh, but uh, we perform uh, uh, splenic devascularization sometimes on the, when GRW is less than 1%, and another situation is a large splenomegaly. Under that situation, we uh, add the uh, sp uh, splenic devascularization in order to uh, in order to decrease coral coral uh, coral, uh, coral hyperperfusion and also to correct uh, cytopenia. Uh, when uh, in, in my mind, we should uh, think uh, we should think two situation: surgical interruption, uh, collateral interruption, and uh, polar hyperperfusion per per related to polar hyperperfusion is a little bit separately. Immediate post-op period, uh, particularly uh, within ten days, enough. Uh, uh, within within uh, seven days, etiquette polar pressure is uh, etiquette hyper perfusion is important. But thereafter, around seven day after, we should be very cautious about uh, polar flow still, uh, because uh, or because at that time, grabs uh, uh, regenerate uh, rapidly regenerated and and subsequently. Sinusoidal space uh, uh, decreased. Transient polar hypertension reappear. So, to uh, uh, to avoid polar hyperperfusion and to avoid polar flow still, we should think about uh, a little bit differently. Yeah. Any comments, Dr. Abhay, Dr. Alu? Uh, hi, Dr. Narendra. Actually, I have one question for you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you showed one of the cases uh, where there was a left paraortic lymph node and yes. you used the transvascular access. Was it considered to do, sample that lymph node under CT guidance? I think it was. So uh, we have done only two of these. Uh, uh, transvascular in these seven, eight years. We don't do transvascular. I think it was considered for IR. I don't know by now. Okay, because it, uh, from the image which was shown, it no. would be so, very straightforward for... Okay. So taking, okay. trans, taking transvascular is very rare for us. We don't do transvascular. We refer to you. <laughs> sure. so it is only second transvascular in my nine years here. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, I know. Otherwise, you guys are so good. You know, wherever we find it difficult to reach, uh, you're always a call away. So maybe uh, it was discovered on table that this is transvascular, but patient had no coagulopathy and it was decided. I don't know because I didn't do it. Oh, okay. Okay. There, there's one question for Dr. Amar. So you said that in the last nine years, you've probably done 12 RHV stentings. So I would like to know yeah, that good, of... Good. Pardon? Good. It includes both angioplasty and stenting. I would have done only six stenting. I rarely do stenting. First of all, we do always do angioplasty. We see the patient. If there is a recurrence, don't, then only we put a stent. We rarely put a stent. Yeah, so, so that's exactly what I want to know that whether how many of these patients matured from angioplasty and later on were stented and how many were primarily stented. So I guess you followed the same approach as you did in this particular case. None of them had ever been primarily stented. All patients underwent uh, angioplasty first, but yeah, there were a couple of patients who required stenting within three months of interval. This was one of the patients who required stenting after two, two years. years. So this was a bit, you know, a difficult case. That's why I presented it here. But uh, those who require stenting, they come up very early because most of them would have ascites and uh, uh, they continue to have ascites. And you do a angioplasty initially, they'll say ki urine output has increased, but gradually they'll again have uh, ascites within a month or so. And then uh, again, once you do a, a HVPG and you'll find a raised pressure, LSM is definitely raised. 
uh, and it, it was seen in one of our papers also that an LSM is very useful in actually seeing liver congestion in any of patients, be it trans uh, post-transplant setting or a normal primary bud carry. So this is how we follow our patients. Okay, so last question to Dr. Rohit. Yes, sir. Why do tips, why not just a portal vein stenting after portal vein has been opened? It is ah, actually, sir, patient is planned for the transplant and we can't consume the whole length of the portal vein. Main portal vein is needed for the anastomosis, portal vein to portal vein physiological. The purpose of whole procedure to provide adequate portal vein length, good portal vein with no residual thrombosis, no portal vein thickening to provide a patency after a transplant and make physiological anastomosis rather than a using jump graft or any other surgical procedure. Okay, thank you. I thank all speakers for great videos. Can I ask and a question to Dr. Moon, if uh, Dr. Narendra, if you have uh, one minute. Yeah. Uh, okay, fine. Yeah, Dr. Moon, I just wanted to ask if would you ever consider doing a, a pre-surgical closure of the shunt? Like if you know that shunt is large, and HVPG has been done where the pressure is very low. So if HVPG is low, that means we know that the portal flow is being diverted. And you see a big shunt on CT scan. Would you ever consider closing the shunt prior to transplant and then take, take the patient for transplant? <laughs> yeah. Uh, prior, before liver transplantation, we do not uh, consider uh, interruption of uh, shunt. Uh, you know, for example, a big spleen or renal shunt patients, preoperatively, uh, uh, we we may we may perform BRTO, uh, sometimes the part. Under that situation, oral hypertension, uh, newly developed oral hypertension, and uh, big uh, uh, large amount of ascites uh, rapidly develop. Uh, so subsequently, patient uh, condition rapidly can deteriorate. So because of that uh, uh, cause, uh, that reason, we do not consider preoperative shunt of uh, shunt interruption. Okay. Yeah. Thank you I so thank, much. I thank all speakers and chairpersons. Thank you. Thank you all. We move to next session. I invite Dr. Randeer Sood. He is a renowned person for his ERCP skills. He is chairman, gastroenterology, and Institute of Digestive and Hepatobiliary Sciences at Medanta. He will speak on stenting of difficult biliary strictures. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Narendra, and it is a pleasure to be uh, here. Uh, I'll straightway start because I know that you people are running a little late. So uh, I'll start with my lecture. You know, are you able to see my slides? Yes, sir. Okay. So, you know, when we talk of uh, live donor liver transplant uh, strictures, the, uh, the problem is that most of these strictures are uh, uh, difficult. They are not the, this is not that each, uh, and there's any simple LDLT stricture, because you can see there's a mismatch of the uh, donor uh, ducts and the recipient duct. And this is as the graft grows, and rotates, it causes a kink at the anastomotic site. And this causes a very peripheral and uh, a, a very distorted stricture. And the uh, more important is that our uh, surgeons have developed skills of uh, uh, creating a very difficult anastomosis. They will have anastomotic uh, uh, spectacle anastomosis. They will anastomose one segmental duct with the, the cystic duct or they will have multiple ducts being anastomosed at uh, different areas, which makes our job even more difficult to drain the entire graft liver in case of any stricture formation or obstruction. However, the good thing is that aggressive endotherapy today can uh, have long-term uh, you know, relief of uh, uh, symptoms and uh, remodeling of stricture in almost two thirds of the patients. And very tight stricture is the commonest cause of failure. The challenging LDLT biliary strictures are spectacle anastomosis, as I told you, cystic duct anastomosis, hepaticojejunosmy, which is a totally different ballgame altogether, uh, and a tight stricture, non dilated bile duct proximal to the stricture, which can happen in a, a, when, the, a, when this early stricture or if the liver is partially fibrosed or is becoming serotic again, or total separation of graft duct from the native CBD, 
or uh, non anastomotic structures which are a different category of structures altogether i'm not going to touch upon that how do we overcome this situation the we do it with special guide wires particularly our savior is a, a thermo j tip high torque hydrophilic guide wire we use normally o25 or o31 uh, guide wire because they are easy to rotate and we use uh, bare hand technique to do the torquing of our guide wires we use a short length 250 cm guide wire which is easily torqueable than the 400 cm guide wire and when there's a tight structure we first resort to pancreatic uh, dilator which has a four french tip and is a teflon uh, continuous sheet so there's it has a good uh, you know axial force it can go through tight structures but at times the structure particularly if the patient put, uh, presents with the structure more than one year uh, uh, after the surgery these structures can be very fibrotic and difficult to pass then we have realized that using a six french cystotome is a wonderful technique which i'll be demonstrating because this we use learned from the eus guided uh, uh, you know uh, um, pancreatic duct punctures and bile duct punctures and uh, the, we we now use it routinely for difficult structure uh, uh, to pass uh, to, buy, uh, to, uh, to after we get a guide wire across to pass a uh, structure we use a six french cystotome and it has been very useful fully covered sems are another technique which we use not for access but when we have a structure which is difficult to re remodel and we are unable to do it with conventional plastic sems or it is a very difficult site where we have been able to get across very with difficulty we prefer to do one time procedure of fully covered sems placement and i'll come to the nuances of that if we are able to go across the structure then we do use our uh, help of take our help of our interventional radiologists and do ptbd either do a same sitting random technique or a, a, a second session random technique there's another uh, technique which we ourselves haven't used but which is been there for some time but because of non availability of the rare earth magnets to us of the size which are compatible with endoscopic placements Uh, we are not using otherwise magnetic compression and osmosis is another technique which is very useful for totally separated ducts balloon assisted endoscopy is which what we use when we have a hepatocojejunostomy in osmotic structure where we and we do it uh, uh, we do balloon dilatation normally we do not put in uh, stents in this situation because uh, through the balloon endoscopes of today the stent assembly does not go and it's not long enough and if everything fails then of course surgery is the last resort now failure of passing the guide wire is the single most important factor and the, the, i have given you three studies which are, which clearly show that there are about 17 16% to 38% of the patients where you may not be able to put a guide wire across a tight structure and uh, we, we use as i told you A special guide wires and manipulating it, which I'll show demonstrate to you the videos as the first step. If it fails, now we can position place a guide wire across the structure with the help of a colonoscope, because colonoscope helps us to uh, you know identify the uh, anastomotic site and then maneuver a guide wire across. But it is easier said than done. and uh, as i uh, you know today we have some data that uh, almost two third of the structures can be successfully uh, passed with a guide wire like this in a very tight structure we either use sohendra pancreatic dilator or a six french cystotome now coming to the guide wire manipulation i'll present you two cases like this case which is uh, in front of you you can see that the right anterior segmental duct of the graft is beautifully pacified but in our um, mrcp we had a right posterior duct structure and which was not easily passable so wh what do we do we take a thermo o25 try to maneuver this thermo and with the finger uh, with the bare hand we torque it and uh, you know uh, and pass it into the uh, non opacified ducts and after we have passed you all know that once we have a guide wire across we can uh, use something or the other to get across that uh, stenosis 
This is another patient who's uh, recently transplanted, 12 day stricture and a leak. And you know, it's very difficult in this situation, in such a acute angle to pass a guide wire. We could easily pass a guide wire in this ductal system, but right anterior segmental duct, we were unable to till we uh, use the thermo and we could maneuver the guide wire across that uh, stricture and uh, successfully stented that patient. Now, this is another patient where we use cholangioscope to pass the guide wire. You can see that uh, we could opacify the, the one system, but there was another anastomosis, anastomosis. We could not even get the uh, dye across even after using a cholangian cholangiogram. So we use uh, uh, you know, uh, a cholangioscope to, uh, uh, to be very close to the uh, anastomotic site. And we use O2, O31 uh, thermo guide wire through the cholangioscope. And uh, we could ultimately, uh, you know, pass the guide wire across, but the stricture was so tight. So we used a six French cystotome, which has a, a, a you know, a, a, a electrocautery tip at the, at the, uh, in, the uh, in the distal end. And uh, by giving a cut current, we can easily pass through a fibrotic stricture. That's what we did in this patient. And subsequently, we could dilate it with a, uh, you know, biliary dilator and put in our, uh, do the stenting. This is another patient where uh, you can uh, see that we are struggling to pass a, a, a cystotome across a tight stricture till we use the electrocautery and the, uh, you know, it's a coaxial system. So no risk of going astray. So you, the moment you are against the resistance, you give the uh, uh, electrocautery uh, one pedal and the uh, cystotome go, goes across a very fibrotic structure and we find it to be extremely helpful. Now look at the data. There's one study of 22 cases of using uh, cystotome in, uh, in facilitated strictoplasty. This had 100% success rate. Two of the 22 patients developed complications. One was for pancreatic duct structures and one was hemobilia and uh, CA gallbladder, but no complication happened in benign structures. So this is a standard practice which we are using today. And we have a paper which is in press uh, on this uh, technique from our center. <coughs> then there's a situation like this. You have a patient who has got three strictures at the anastomotic site, that there's a extension of the uh, stricture into the segmental ducts and we were able to pass the guide wires across and all the all the uh, uh, segments but we could pass uh, place stents in these two segments but the third segment was uh, very uh, stubborn and so we again used took help of six french cystotome over the guide wire we went across And after we had the access of the, uh, through the cystotome uh, uh, across the stricture, we passed the third stent and uh, the, the, all the segments of this patient could be drained and uh, subsequent management was fairly easy. Now, another problematic area is when, when there's a cystic rectum So the reason is that valves of feaster is, do not allow a routine uh, guide wire to go across the, the and we again have to use a, a J tip thermo and rotate it to get across. And this is a patient uh, uh, where we, uh, you know, had such anastomosis and we could we use that technique and could place stents across the cystic duct and anastomosis. Another technique which is not meant for difficult structures, but I thought it is worth mentioning here in this forum. This is a technique which Japanese use very often of place intraductal placement of plastic stents. The unique feature of this is that the distal end of the plastic stent is uh, cut and uh, they tie a lasso of the suture, nylon suture or a silk suture. And then these, uh, without peplotomy, these stents are kept intraductally. And you can see that big advantage is that the, the, uh, the res resolution rate of anastomotic structure is fairly high and you need Fewer ERCPs, no average ERCPs in the in the conventional way is around four, but in this uh, technique, only 1.4 average ERCPs could do the job. <coughs> when we have difficult strictures, which we are unable to pass, and we think that putting in bigger plastic stents will be a challenge, we resort to specially designed uh, fully covered metal stents. This is what is a coffee stent, which is a four centimeter 
8 millimeter diameter uh, uh, stent which can be kept intraductly it has a radio opaque uh, titanium lasso which hangs outside the papilla and this is a patient where we had <coughs> placed a plastic stent in, into one segmental duct and we deployed a metal stent in the other, other segment and removed the, uh, both the stents after four months with the resolution of strictures. But the data of uh, uh, you know, fully covered metal stents in the LDLT is not so um, uh, uh, you know, good. In fact, the, there's no superiority over the multiple plastic stents has been shown by use of uh, metal stents. It's more to decrease the number of uh, procedures and uh, uh, to overcome a difficult situation. Now, this is where we use uh, our, plast uh, our interventional radiologists uh, uh, when we are unable to get our guide wire across. And uh, you can see this is a very tight structure. And uh, after the uh, interventional radiologist gives us a guide wire into the dundum, we can easily pass a dilator across and then we can, it is easy for us. Magnetic compression anastomosis is another technique which is, a, uh, which is uh, used only when there's total disruption. And the, uh, the, the, disrupt, the length between in the disruption should be less than one centimeter. One end of the one daughter magnet, which is a rare earth magnet in a cylindrical shape is, is placed and by interventional radiologist at the tip of the uh, you know, uh, opacified ducts. And we go endoscopically in a preloaded uh, 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 catheter and place the other, other magnet at the distal end of the stricture. And uh, over a period of time, these, uh, they, these, both the magnets unite and they recanalize the duct and you can see a beautiful anastomosis is created. Now, this is, the, this is how a preloaded catheter of this rare earth magnet can be placed endoscopically. So far, the magnet size is not small for us to take it through the biopsies channel. We have to preload it uh, and go with the uh, endoscope, uh, uh, you know, with the magnet. This is the data which is available of uh, uh, magnetic compression osmosis. In fact, there is more data available now with this technique. And the mean distance between the magnets was 6.4 millimeter. And the duration is nearly two months for which it is kept and re-stenosis re happened only in one out of 17 of these patients. It has been used in bilionteric anastomosis, re-establishment of bilionteric anastomosis, but not in LDLT situations so far. To summarize, LDLT strictures are technically more challenging, but with aggressive endotherapy, more than 80% patients can be treated. Failure of passing guide wire across the stricture occurs in about 17 to 18%, 38%. Special guide wires, special dilators, and skill is needed to overcome these difficult strictures. Clungioscopic placement is possible in two-thirds of the failed patients. But again, its, an, it's procedure is difficult because after you have put in the guide wire, taking out the clungioscope with the guide wire uh, being retained is not so easy. Multiple plastic stents still remain the standard of care and SEMS is used selectively. And uh, internal uh, MPS reduces the number of interventions. Need for PTBD is seen about 15% to 20% 20, 20 of the patients. And use of clungioscopy and magnetic compression and osmosis and LDLT strictures looks promises, promising but is under evaluation. We have no personal experience with um, magnetic compression and osmosis. Thank you very much for patient hearing. Thank you, sir. I invite chairpersons, Dr. Prashant Solanki. He is senior gastroenterologist at Meerut, and Dr. Anwar Khandelwal, senior interventional radiologist at Medanta, for any comments or questions. I have one question for Dr. Anwar. How common you find it difficult to cross a structure in PTBD, and what is your experience with hepaticogastrostomy? So, uh, in our experience here, uh, I think uh, it's not very uh, common that we can't cross the structure. Most of the times, we are able to. And uh, um, in cases where we are not able to do it for the first time, uh, repeat attempts have usually led to, uh, you know, uh, success. Uh, two, three things which really matter to us is uh, knowing the anatomy well. Uh, uh, the surgical anatomy as well and uh, having uh, endoscopic images uh, 
to know where the stump is and what is the path really helps us in crossing the stricture. Uh, we have done um, uh, around 10 or 11 cases of hepatic uh, gastrostomy. And that's also because uh, the stomach is very close to the cut surface of the liver in post-operative uh, situation. That's an extra anatomic reconstructions that we have done. Uh, so far, it's been successful, but uh, definitely uh, larger numbers have to be done to establish and the long-term results have to be uh, yet evaluated on that. A good IR is extremely useful to LDLT program. Thank you for being with us always, Dr. Anubhav. I invite Dr. Rajesh Puri. He is Director, Gastroenterology, Institute of Digestive and Hepatobiliary Sciences. He will speak on endoscopic management of obesity in patients with cirrhosis. Dr. Soyan and the entire organizing team for giving this opportunity. I'm going to talk endoscopic bariatric procedure in patient with cirrhosis. Although very less data is available, or in fact, there is no data, the role of endoscopy in obese cirrhotic patient. So what I have decided is to talk about what an endoscopy can offer to an obese patient, and can we apply any of these procedures in cirrhotic patients. As you know that obesity is epidemic to pandemic in the developed countries, but according to the ICMR study in next 15 to 20 years, obesity will become epidemic in India. That leads to the more number of cases of Nash related CLD and obesity associated problem like diabetes, hypertension, CAD and chronic liver disease. As we know that the management of obesity it is either a lifestyle therapies, modification of the lifestyle, medication, which is least effective, but the less invasive. On the other hand, we have a most invasive methods, that is the surgery, but it is very effective, it is very invasive. And only 1% of the obese population accept this. So there is a huge gap from the least effective therapy to the most effective therapy, which is more invasive. We have less invasive endoscopic methods in the form of balloon, aspirocyst, ESG, and maybe a combination of therapy. So I think in coming year, and especially those patients who are cirrhotic, endoscopy may fill the gap between these two. Why people are not opting for the bariatric surgery? Because they have a low, low acceptance rate. The expertise of the bariatric surgeon is less. The morbidity and the late complication associated with the bariatric surgeries are there. And in patient of chronic liver disease, the risk of decompensation and the post-operative complication will be less. So in bariatric, in obese patient, the bariatric surgery, especially patient with the chronic liver disease is not possible. All obese patient, are not the right candidate for endoscopy. It is very important we should select these patients carefully so we can make sure that endoscopy should give the better results. Those patients who has a BMI of 30 to 34 without comorbidity, BMI of 35 to 39 with the comorbidity, or patient who has a BMI of 40 as a bridge to the surgery, those patients who has associated comorbidity, who has a BMI of more than 40 or 45, who can direct, who cannot directly subject it to a surgical intervention, you can do the endoscopic method as a bridge to surgery. It is very important before doing any endoscopic therapy, you should rule out eating disorder in that patient and treat first. When we talk in contrast to the cirrhotic patients, Whenever you are planning for endoscopic method, it is important. You should rule out large esophageal varices, gastric varices, coagulopathy, and the large hiatus hernia. If patient has a esophageal varices, it is important. You should eradicate, and then you can offer the patient for the endoscopic therapy. Now, how does endoscopic bariatric procedure help? 
they not only compartmentalize the stomach and restrict the volume, they delay the stomach emptying time, act as a partial outlet obstruction, bypass proximal duodenum, that is important, and they altered the metabolic physiological mechanism also, but in data, in cirrhosis is limited as there's no study available. Various endoscopic methods, that is gastric and duodenal. Gastric is mainly used for, for reduction of the weight and duodenal procedures are mainly for metabolic control, that is control of the diabetes. In gastric procedure, we have balloon, other space occupying devices like shuttle, aspiration therapy and the gastroplasty technique. If I broadly look, then I think the balloons and the aspiration therapy may be feasible in cirrhotic patients. But question comes about the intragastric balloon, are they effective or they are not effective? There's a flip side of the coin. Because once you put the balloon, patient loses weight, but there is a chances of regain of the weight. So I think the most important thing is choosing the right patient for endoscopic balloon placement or bridge to a surgery or in cirrhotic patients, I think balloons are very effective. The available balloons are Apollo Obera balloon or the reshaped DO balloon, both are FDA approved. Obera balloon is available, it is a single silicon balloon. You can introduce around 400 to 700 ml of the saline and they require endoscopy to be placed and they should be kept for six months. A reshaped DO balloon, which has two balloon, they are together, they are also silicon balloon and the total volume of the water can be filled around 750 to 900 ml. They require endoscopy and the total duration they can be kept in the stomach is for six months. The recently is introduced, I will not say recently from the last five years, we have a spats balloon which is adjustable. The beauty of this balloon is you can start with a low volume of water, the side effect of the balloon placement can be reduced and in a very short period of the time, within a one to two week time, you can increase the volume of the water and this balloon can be kept for one year also. The two, two ingested balloon has come up. The obelon is approved by the FDA. They consist of the gas and they swallow these balloon and they require endoscopy to remove these balloon. So obelon balloon is a swallowable balloon which contain gas, but they require endoscopy to remove. But recently, the Eluron technology has come up with a new balloon and they degrade in the stomach in three to four months time and they can pass in the stool so they don't require any endoscopic procedure. The balloon, apart from the weight loss, they also help in other parameters like improvement in the blood glucose, HB1AC, triglyceride level, waist circumference, diastolic blood pressure and the improvement in the ALT level also. So this is the long follow-up of five years after placing the balloon in 500 patients. And what they have seen is the baseline weight from 125 kg to the 98 kg appear achieved in six to 12 months time. But within five years, there is again regain of the weight. And similar things were seen with the BMI, with the baseline excess weight, final excess weight, so they have reduced, but within five years, there is a regain. So what should be done in this patient? Those who are on balloon, once they reduce the weight, then it is important they should maintain the weight loss. And how can you maintain the weight loss? That you have to do a lifestyle modification by dietary therapy, by physical activity and exercise, behavioral therapy, and the drug therapy can be used. Another important thing is, you can reinsert the balloon and once the patient is fit enough to go for a surgery as a bridge to the balloon has been placed, as a bridge the balloon has been placed, then you can subject these patients to the surgery. So two, three important things for maintenance of weight loss is lifestyle modification, reinsertion of balloon or subjecting these patients to the surgical intervention. There is a data available about the repeat balloon placement. This is the study about 112 patients the mean BMI was 38 or 39. After the first balloon, the BMI has come to 32. And the second, second balloon placement, the BMI will remain around 30. So putting a second balloon 
reduces the weight not only but also keep the weight static also the overall effect of the balloon not only act mechanically but also act as a neurohormonal level the total body weight reduces around 10 to 15% excess body weight loss ranging from 15 to 35% how to sustain weight loss post balloon removal is very important balloon is associated with a minor side effect in the form of pain abdomen nausea vomiting which can be controlled with the medication which is seen in one third of the patient around 7% of the patient because of these side effects they require early removal of the balloon in our series also around 5% of the patient in spite of explaining prior putting the balloon they requires early removal of the balloon the more serious side effect has been seen in the form of small bowel obstruction in 0.3% cases and the gastric perforation is seen in 0.1% of the cases and these balloon can migrate and they may require surgical intervention i think aspire assist is a good and which can be used in the cirrhotic patient which is my feeling and what is aspire assist is like a peg you do the peg in super obese patient this has been tried in 15 to 20 patients the peg placement is done and once the patient eat complete food he is allowed to eat as much as he want to eat and within 15 to 20 minutes once he feels satiety you open the pack tube and you take out around 70% of the food and you can restall the water in this the concept of the aspire assist is patient is allowed to eat but within 15 to 20 minute when the food is in the stomach and partly has gone into the tube when the satiety goes down you remove 75% of the food so that help in reduction of the weight so i think this is the modality the literature is not seen in the cirrhotic but i think cirrhosis with the uh, child b this can be done even in the child c patients if we do the aspire assist it can help in reduction in the weight so i think this is one thing which can be tried but the data in a cirrhotic patient is not available endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty here you are doing the endoscopically sleeve as it is done in the surgical sleeve and what you do with the help of dual channel endoscope you apply the suture on the greater curvature of the stomach and you reduce the volume of the stomach by 70% total reduction the total volume less is 30% only the fundus of the stomach less and you apply the suture on the greater curvature of the stomach and by reducing the volume it help in around 30 to 47% of the excess weight reduction and 25 to 30% of the total weight reduction there is a recently one study in a cirrhotic patient as a proof of concept study has been started in the spain in patient of the cirrhosis can we do the endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty so the proof of the concept study in 10 patients they are starting in the spain now these are the endoscopic devices which is mainly for the metabolic control the duodenal bypass liner you see the duodenal bypass liner is consist of the impermeable fluoropolymer which is around 2 feet and they are radio opaque marker they fit into the first part of the duodenum they have a draw strings in the bars which anchor the duodenal liner into the first part of the duodenum there are there are several efficacy studies available and the excess weight of 30 to 47% has been seen but fda has stopped this trial because of the incidence of the liver abscesses associated pain nausea and vomiting and the rare serious effect in the form of device migration with the small intestine requires surgical intervention but soon fda has approved the variation of the endo barrier and what is the endo variation rather than the bar which fit into the first part of the duodenum there is a stent the lumen opposing stent the part of which is in the pyloric antrum so it it it, it act as a horseshoe shape and it is stuck into the pyloric antrum and this is a duodenal liner so there is a malabsorption of the food up to the dj flexure and there is a significant reduction of the weight as well as metabolic control this study is going on and from aig the this they are enrolled and they are doing this study now the incisional less anastomotic system here what you are doing is you are having an upper gi scope going beyond the dj flexure and for from, from the colonoscope you reach up to the terminal ileum and the two magnets they join and on the day 6 there's a formation of the jejuno ileal bypass 
and you are producing the jejunal ileal bypass, the entire jejunum, which act as an obesity control center, is bypassed and there's a significant reduction in the weight as well as metabolic control is seen, but the studies are limited. Another recently developed method that is a Revita methods that is called as duodenal resurfacing. The elevate the mucosa with the saline, ablation with the hot fluid balloon, and there is a regeneration of the duodenal mucosa. So what you are doing, there's a diseased mucosa, there's a hypothesis in a patient of the diabetes, the duodenal and the proximal jejunal mucosa is bad. You restore by removing the bad mucosa. So by putting the hot fluid balloon, you produce the necrosis of the duodenal mucosa. And within three to six weeks, there's a regeneration of the new duodenal mucosa. There's a better signaling for the, for the diabetes control. And how you do it? This is the method. You can do it. You inject into the submucosa the saline. You lift the submucosa and you start from eight centimeter from the ampulla of wetter and up to the DJ flexure around 15 to 20 centimeter of the duodenal mucosa was ablated. There is an injection which goes to the submucosa. You inject, you lift the mucosa, and once you have done from the post papilla side up to the 15 centimeter with the hot water, you produce the ablation of the duodenal mucosa. And within three months, there is a new duodenal mucosa which has a better hormonal signaling and help in control of the diabetes. Now, when we talk about the endoscopic approach in the CLD patient, what I have discussed, what is an endoscopist can offer to the obese patients. We talk about the endoscopic approach in the CLD patient. I think intragastric balloon, yes, but it is important the patient should not have a child's score C or the large esophageal and the fundal varices should not be there and it should not be significantly coagulopathy. Endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, no trials in the cirrhotic patient, but one proof of the concept study from this pain has been enrolled. Aspire assist, yes, in my opinion, this can be done, but there is no data in cirrhotic patients. Endo barrier, I think, again, can be done in the cirrhotic patients, but no literature available. Magnets, yes, but there is no literature available. Revita procedure, I think we should avoid because you are producing the necrosis of the mucosa. These patients might bleed because of the, because of the obesity, because of the coagulopathy. So what would the cirrhotic patients, those patients who are obese, where there's a donor recipient mismatch, I think we should acquire a minimally invasive method. We should correct the coagulopathy. We should look for the viruses. A patient with a child C, the risk of malnutrition and the risk of decomposition will be there. But I think there's a no data in literature other than balloon. And I think first time in the world we have published the intragallic gastric balloon as a novel modality for weight reduction in patient with cirrhosis and morbid obese patient who are awaiting for the liver transplantation. We did this in six patients and initially three patients we put the PIB and the last seven patients we put the SPADS balloon. Out of eight patients, six patients underwent liver transplant and two patients was awaiting. That data, I'm not very sure what happened to these two patients. So to ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, the multiple endoscopic treatment are now available, which can likely fill the gap between the least invasive and the most invasive, the least invasive, which is less effective in the form of diet control and the more invasive in the form of surgery. I think in between endoscopy can fill the gap there's a lot of significant advancement has happened in the last four years. In non steroidic patients, there's a good amount of data. Endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty is very good. But for endoscopic treatment in steroidic patients, a favorable risk-benefit ratio should be taken care. Is cost-effective, is reversible. Sequential therapy can be done. And combination of the gastric as well as duodenal procedure can be done. Cirrhosis has several techniques, may be applicable, but it requires more scientific data. Thank you for patience hearing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very interesting concept. There is a one comment in questions and answer session. Please answer that. We are late. I request one quick comment by Dr. Anubhav or Dr. Prashant. So uh, it's just an addition to what uh, uh, Dr. Rajeshwari just uh, 
uh, enlightened us with. And it's that uh, patients, uh, now there's a new data which is coming out on uh, embolization procedures, bariatric embolization, uh, which can be done for patients uh, who do not opt for endoscopic or surgical methods. And uh, this is basically aimed at uh, the endocrine function of the, um, uh, uh, of the stomach, the fundus basically, which produces ghrelin. And uh, it's... Uh, you embolize the left gastric artery and uh, uh, there's a reduction in production of the ghrelin, which reduces the uh, hunger and helps in, you know, reducing Thank the Thank you, weight. Dr. Anubhav. Yeah. Uh, we are late by half hour. We move to next session. Thought in hepatology. I invite chairpersons, Dr. Ajay Duseja. He is professor and head of unit two, department of hepatology at PGI Chandigarh. Dr. Samir Shah, he is head department of hepatology, Institute of Liver Disease, HPB Surgery and Transplant, Global Hospitals, Mumbai, and Dr. Ravi Chand. He is consultant chief of liver transplant and HPB surgery at KIMS Hospital, Hyderabad. I would like to invite first speaker. This is a state of art lecture, Nash Fibrosis from Matrix to Medicine, Dr. Scott Feedbrain. He is Dean for Therapeutic Discovery, Fishberg Professor of Medicine, Chief Division of Liver Disease, Ichan School of Medicine, Mount Sinai. Dr. Scott. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for including me. Uh, can you confirm you can hear me adequately and see my slides? Yes, and we can see your slides. Perfect. Um, I see some of my uh, friends and colleagues. It's nice to see many of you. I also want to thank Niraj Siraf and tell them how proud we are uh, as a graduate of our liver, hep our hepatology transplantation program, uh, his success continues to be our success. So we're very pleased about that. Uh, in the brief few minutes, I'm gonna uh, uh, introduce some of the exciting new developments in uh, the biology of extracellular matrix, and more importantly, their translation in the context of uh, NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. I'm trying to advance, okay. Um, so I, I, I'll very briefly uh, review what we've accomplished. I call this the end of the beginning. Uh, the end of the beginning, meaning we now recognize NASH as a large unmet need that's growing. Uh, we also recognize that scarring or fibrosis is the critical driver of clinical outcomes. And there are several basic and translational observations uh, that I'll point to that uh, underscore the success we've had to date. But of course, we don't have any approved therapies yet. So we're right on the cusp of translating new knowledge about NASH fibrosis into new therapies. Uh, our unmet needs are both in the basic translational as well as in the clinical setting. Um, I'll be reviewing each of these in a little bit of detail uh, as time permits. First to the basics, it's worth remembering that NASH is really one component of a progressive disease, uh, certainly very prevalent in India, uh, as well as in uh, Western Europe and North America, and growing rapidly, as you're aware. Um, the main focus for therapy development is in this population, the NASH population. Uh, regulatory agencies have made clear that they're uh, not looking to treat fat per se, uh, even though some would argue that treating fat without uh, fibrosis still may attenuate progression and improve cardiovascular outcomes. But uh, the, the reality is that uh, regulatory agencies like the FDA are insisting that we focus on patients who already have active NASH and fibrosis. And there are a handful of trials that are actually targeting cirrhosis as well. Bear in mind that NASH not only can give rise to cirrhosis, but uh, importantly, there is a rising risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in this population. And what's distinct about this uh, cancer in NASH is that first of all, uh, it has a higher propensity than other etiologies to arise in a non cirrhotic liver, which means we're gonna need to think about screening for HCC at earlier stages so we can detect early curable lesions. Uh, and secondly, based on work from Tim Gretton at NCI, uh, these cancers may not be as responsive to the recently developed checkpoint inhibitors and immuno-oncology therapies that seem to be so effective in many cancers. So lots of challenges ahead. When we score the disease, it's worth remembering 
that while there are different components of the so-called NAFL deactivity score, the only one that correlates uh, directly with outcomes is fibrosis. And that's underscored in this slide here, looking at the clinical outcomes in patients based on their stage of fibrosis at the onset of a 300 month period. So patients who have zero uh, stage fibrosis have relatively normal uh, life uh, expectancy. Those who already have stage four or cirrhosis over time have a uh, dismal or a worsening outcome. And this among many studies now really reinforces the importance of attenuating fibrosis progression if we're going to achieve any success in changing the natural history of NAFLD or NASH. As some of you may know, my own scientific work has focused on the main fibrogenic cell in the liver, the hepatic stellate cell shown here. This is a perisinusoidal cell that is in the subendothelial space of DISA and has vitamin A droplets surrounding the nucleus that allowed us to both identify and develop methods to purify these cells many years ago. We also learned that the key issue is that stellate cells undergo activation in any form of liver injury, including NASH, and that leads to accumulation of scar matrix in the subendothelial space, uh, proliferation of stellate cells, loss of differentiated function of hepatocytes, and activation of macrophages with loss of pores. Um, we have developed some recent techniques to uh, visualize stellate cells in new ways. This is just to show you a new method called uh, the GLASS method, which involves tissue clearing. This is uh, data generated by former postdoc, now faculty in my group, Dr. Shuang Wang. And what you can see are these elegant foot processes in purple that represent the parasitic foot processes of stellate cells interacting with cells in green, which are macrophages. And this points to the, the, uh, the intimate cell-cell interactions that are increasingly being described between fibrogenic stellate cells and the macrophages. And again, uh, this is a, a, a a, a new area of research. And in particular, we're beginning to learn much more about different subsets, both macrophages and stellate cells. And these subsets may have different functions. From the early observations of stellate cell activation, we have constructed for many years a model that explains how these cells respond to injury, whether it's uh, viral hepatitis or in the case of NAFLD, lipotoxicity or injury to hepatocytes. This elicits signals, many of which have been identified in NASH, that activate stellate cells and initiate a cascade of events that all conspire to make more inflammation and scar. Um, and recent studies have begun to ask what happens to stellate cells when fibrosis is regressing. Uh, earlier studies showed that the cells can deactivate or undergo programmed cell death. More recent studies uh, from uh, collaborators labs now show that one of the key events is that stellate cells can also become senescent. And those senescent cells have unique uh, secretory and, geno uh, and genetic profiles that may foster fibrosis. And so uh, based on the emerging importance of senescent uh, stellate cells, my collaborator, Scott Lowe, who's a world renowned authority in uh, liver cancer, developed a method for uh, selectively depleting senescent T cell, uh, senescent stellate cells using something called CAR T cells. Uh, I don't have time to review this in detail. We were involved, although it was really the work of Dr. Lowe's lab that really drove this project. Uh, and what they did is identified that the uh, cell surface protein neuroplasmin is an activator receptor or UPAR was a marker of senescent stellate cells. And so they generated uh, effectively guided missiles or CAR T cells that can target only the senescent stellate cells and lead to their depletion. Uh, and effectively what, was, what uh, Scott's group showed is that when you deplete senescent stellate cells, and that's shown in the brown dots here, there's a marked diminution in fibrotic areas and also a reduction in beta-gal activity, which is a senescence marker, and an increase in albumin suggesting this restores liver function all of which speaks to the idea that uh, we might actually be able to develop cell-based therapies that can selectively deplete the most pathogenic stellate cells while leaving the remainder of the liver intact. And this isn't just a theoretical prospect. CAR T cells are now approved uh, largely for hematologic malignancies, uh, but the use of CAR T cells for non-cancer to reduce fibrotic populations is a very realistic prospect in the coming years. 
So now let me turn a little bit more to where we're going next and what our unmet needs are. Um, we need to understand more about cell-cell interactions. And this just summarizes a very lovely paper over a year ago from University of Michigan and from investigators in China that used what is now a very powerful technique of single cell sequencing and examined the different cell populations in mice on an amylin or NASH inducing diet. They characterized macrophages and identified a subset known as TREM2 positive macrophages and also a, a whole panel of specific molecules that are secreted by activated stellate cells. And so by using these single cell RNA sequencing methods, we can now literally uh, identify multiple subgroups of each cell type, and that's shown in the upper panel here, uh, that together give us a much richer and more realistic picture of the heterogeneity of different cells contributing to fibrosis and NASH. We're also beginning to ask what happens when liver fibrosis regresses, because after all, if the liver knows how to regress fibrosis, uh, we should exploit those endogenous signals therapeutically. And there's a new area of research known as specialized pro-resolving mediators, which are lipid-based molecules uh, that are, uh, in, uh, that are uh, effectively recruited to regress inflammation, uh, lose activated myofibroblasts or stellate cells, uh, and promote extracellular matrix degradation. And so there's a whole area of research to try to understand what are the endogenous molecules that help resolve fibrosis in human disease, for example, after curing hepatitis C. And can we collect those molecules and use them as a therapy to accelerate resolution of fibrosis? And uh, while it's early, I think there's going to be a lot of exciting information about these mediators. On the clinical side, there's also a lot of progress and a lot of prospects. Uh, this is one recent study from Rohit Lumba, a University of California, San Diego, among many that are beginning to link the composition of the gut microbiome to specific outcomes in liver disease. And in the case of this very important paper, Rohit and his group identified a gut microbiome derived signature that can predict cirrhosis. And this is really very satisfying because uh, first of all, we know that NASH uh, tends to cluster in first degree relatives. And while genetics certainly contributes to the familial clustering of NASH, so does the fact that first degree relatives often share the same microbiome. And it speaks to the idea that from these signatures, we can tease out specific uh, bacteria or bacterial subspecies that are pathogenic and perhaps manipulate the microbiome therapeutically to decrease the signals coming from the microbiome that are driving NASH. I believe this is one of the most important areas for the future study, because of course, man manipulating the microbiome therapeutically could be a very straightforward way of, uh, of, in, of um, sorry, a very straightforward way of uh, improving fibrosis. And there's a lot of uh, activity currently uh, specifically to understand and, and harness the power of the microbiome in developing novel therapies. I believe this will be one of the hottest areas in the next 10 years. And in fact, many of the endoscopic techniques you heard about in the prior lecture to treat obesity are probably acting in part through changes in the microbiome that are elicited by either uh, duodenal resurfacing or uh, bypass techniques. Of course, the final question is which components of the signature are reflecting direct effects on stellate cells? Are there fibrogenic signals coming from bacteria uh, in the NASH microbiome? Uh, on the diagnostic front, we're also starting to see a lot of progress. Uh, this illustrates one of the several different digital pathology approaches that are being piloted as a diagnostic method to complement conventional liver biopsy. This is from a, an exciting technology developed by a company called Pharmanest uh, and their lead scientist, Matthew Petitjean has shared this slide. And effectively what you can do is take a conventional liver biopsy, uh, colorize it for different features, whether it's fiber architecture, other features, fat, and quantify in individual biopsies, or I'm sorry, in an individual biopsy, the distribution of these different features. In other words, from a conventional liver biopsy, we have the capacity now to extract a huge amount more information than what we normally get from the reading of a, of a traditional pathologist. And I believe this too will begin to complement and, and in many ways replace 
the subjective liver biopsy reads that currently are provided by pathologists, with all due respect to the expertise of pathologists, these are far more objective and obviously more data rich. There are also approaches to develop new um, functional tests. One of them is a company called HepQuant, in which they look at, at the capacity of the normal or healthy liver versus the diseased liver to clear a, a, a C13 labeled cholic acid. And of course, in the presence of a diseased liver, there's more shunting. So those uh, clearance substrates are bypassed the liver and their clearance may be delayed. And uh, Greg Everson, who, who spun out this company, who's a well-respected hepatologist, is now validating the technology in NASH. He's already done so in hepatitis C and in alcohol. And this too could end up being a very sensitive and specific functional readout of liver reserve relevant not only to clinical trials for fibrosis, but also for predicting outcomes in patients who are hospitalized. Uh, there are also a growing list of, of imaging technologies. This is one that's from a company called Perspectum in the United Kingdom, in which they use a direct, a, a so-called corrected T1 weighted imaging method uh, to quantify fibrosis and show that it correlates with fibroinflammation. I don't have time to review this slide in detail, but Suffice to say that in a clinical trial, this one published by Steve Harrison, um, the clinical markers and the serum markers uh, were uh, corresponding very closely in responders to the drug with the changes seen in corrected T1-weighted imaging. Uh, and so uh, this and other technologies like um, MR elastography are rapidly being evaluated and validated as non-invasive endpoints for clinical practice and for clinical trials. Um, certainly, we know that fibrosis resolution is possible in NASH, just as we demonstrated for years that hepatitis C cure has a dramatic yields a dramatic improvement in fibrosis in that disease. This is very exciting data recently published by Philippe Maturin and uh, Lassailly uh, in the Lille group, showing the outcome of bariatric surgery with respect to resolution of NASH. And the first uh, key point of this graph is that the more weight loss that's elicited by the bariatric surgery, the more likely NASH is to resolve. So greater than 10 kilograms per meter square of weight loss yielded an over 90% uh, resolution of NASH. And that translates into a progressive increase or improvement in liver um, histology and reduction in liver fibrosis. So you can see that the fraction of patients at five years after bariatric surgery who have F1, F2, and F3 is greatly reduced compared to the baseline. Although it's worth noting that for patients with F4 in the dark line here, they had no improvement with bariatric surgery. So it's pretty clear that uh, patients with cirrhosis who undergo bariatric surgery are much less likely to have an antifibrotic benefit uh, than patients who are at earlier stages. And of course, uh, surgeons are more reluctant to do bariatric surgery in cirrhotic patients because of the increased risk of complications. So I guess the, the bottom line is if bariatric surgery is contemplated, it's going to be most effective in reversing fibrosis if it's performed in patients before they are cirrhotic. Now, in the clinical side, there is a tremendous explosion of interest in pharmacotherapies. They include drugs that are intended to reduce fat content in hepatocytes, other drugs and targets that improve insulin resistance, that improve the oxidant state of, and health of hepatocytes, as well as anti-inflammatory mediators. And finally, there are drugs and targets that are specifically antifibrotic. Um, the, the, as I'll show you, the bottom line is that there is no curative therapies yet, and even the individual therapies are not as promising as we had hoped. And so it's increasingly likely we'll see combinations of drugs from each of these different groups used together to try to elicit a more effective uh, response to therapy. Uh, one of the recent trials uh, that suggests some promise is the GLP-1 agonist semaglutide from Novo Nordisk. Uh, what was striking in their recent New England Journal paper, first authored by Philip Newsom of Birmingham, is a dramatic reduction in NASH uh, with no worsening of liver fibrosis, and that's shown here. Uh, what was striking, on the other hand, is there was no improvement in liver fibrosis, only a re resolution in NASH. The reasons for this disparity between improvement in NASH or resolution in NASH and improvement in fibrosis has not been fully explained, but it certainly shows promise that we can resolve NASH pharmacologically uh, in up to 59% of patients with this therapy. 
So in the interest of time, I will summarize. We are at the end of the beginning in NASH, ready to leverage our knowledge in pursuit of new diagnostics and therapies. We also uh, recognize that NASH is a discrete disease. It's getting worse in terms of the impact on population health. And we're uncovering many new pathogenic uh, targets that are uh, ripe for translation. And there are advances in several key areas that have laid the groundwork for the next stage. Validation of non-invasive markers that are more sensitive and correlate with outcomes. Incorporation of the microbiome into pathogenic and diagnostic paradigms combination therapies, and ultimately approval of drugs, which we anticipate in the next couple of years, that will establish new benchmarks or standards of care, uh, which will uh, be a basis for comparison for other drugs that follow. So I want to again thank my colleagues and friends, uh, both at Medanta and throughout India, and it's again an honor to join you, and I hope to do so in person in the coming years when our new normal re returns to life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott. For this talk, we will have questions now. For the rest of the talk, we will have questions at the end of session. Any comments or questions by chairpersons? <clears throat> Hi, Professor. Hi, it's good to see you. Yeah. Very nice to see you and uh, very fascinating and educative talk as always. Uh, my just a small question uh, in reference to the digital pathology data which you were showing. I mean, in a recent paper which was published, I think in hepatology, the ATLAS trial, where yes. they looked at the you know, different combinations. And when they uh, you looked at the data on fibrosis improvement, the Silofexor, uh, the FXR agonist, and the Forsocostat, which is the ACC inhibitor, right. on a traditional pathology, didn't show any improvement in fibrosis. But right. when they use this machine learning, you know, kind of uh, um, data, they found that yeah, there was, you know, improvement. So there was some discrepancy there. So yes. your thoughts on that and, and your thoughts on the combination of drugs, which is, you know, could be the future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great question, AJ. It's so nice to see you. I hope things are good in Chandigarh. Yeah. I, I give my warmest regards to Professor Chawla as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, I think your point about the hepatology paper is exactly right, that um, the machine learning techniques are much more um, uh, comprehensive and can detect subtle changes in pathology that will not be recognized by clinical pathologists. In the end, however, remember that biopsy is considered a surrogate endpoint, meaning if a drug is really to be approved and be effective, it must improve clinical outcomes. So the key question is, do these subtle improvements based on machine learning still predict clinical improvements over time? Because otherwise we're gathering information, but we're not really um, predicting outcomes more effectively. So the critical issue with any technique and particularly the machine learning techniques is to make sure that they also ultimately are more predictive than conventional biopsy in predicting subsequent decompensation or development of progression to cirrhosis. Uh, and that will be the gold standard by which the FDA measures these tests. Um, with respect to combinations, um, so there's a, I had a slide but left it out for lack of time, but you know, there's a big discrepancy between the, the efficacy of drugs in animal models and in humans. Drugs look more favorable in animal models than they do in human. And I think in part that reflects the differences in the microbiome and the fact that most mouse models are inbred strains where they're all identical and obviously humans are outbred. And in studies in outbred, hum in outbred mice actually are more predictive of drug responses uh, for, for other diseases and possibly for NASH. The, the approach to combination so far has been very um, empiric. Nobody has really used data-driven uh, uh, combinations saying that if we use a model and we add different combinations, which is the one that achieves the most synergy? They're not doing that. They're basically saying, well, I have an FXR agonist and I have an ACC inhibitor and they're both owned by our company. Let's just try them together. And I, I really hope that we get to the point where companies are not simply combining drugs because they own them, but rather because there's a scientific rationale for synergy. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, sir. For next talk, I invite Dr. Akash Roy.
He is assistant professor at PGI Chandigarh. He will speak on maintenance albumin therapy in end stage liver disease. Akash. Uh, I'll be signing off, folks. Yes, you can. Thank you for being right, with. Thank you very much. Great to see you all. Stay safe. Uh, good evening, everyone. Are the slides visible? Yes. Yes, Akash. Uh, yeah. uh, so, uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, uh, I'm a senior resident at the Department of Hepatology at uh, PGI Chandigarh. Actually, this talk was supposed to be given by uh, Professor Demon. He uh, got engaged in some of his activities, so I would be trying to justify as as my part as what I can uh, in this topic, which say, states maintains albumin in end stage liver disease. Albumin, as we know, is one of the most used as well as most important uh, elements that is there in hepatology. It is the most abundant protein that is there in serum. It is exclusively synthesized in the hepatocytes because of a half-life of 20 days. And most importantly, it exerts about 75 to 80% of the plasma oncotic pressure. The principles of its use is predominantly centered upon this oncotic pressure of albumin. Besides going into a little bit of the basics of the structure of albumin, it has got these characteristic domains, which has got its tendencies to bind to drugs, to bind to proteins, and also the domain three, which has its antioxidant properties. So which brings us to the concept that does as liver disease progresses, do we have an alteration in this concentration as well as the function of the albumin? which has been demonstrated, which is known as the effective albumin concentration, that as cirrhosis progresses, there is a decrease in the effective albumin concentration and addition of the altered form of albumins, which are the marcaptor albumins and the other forms. So that brings us to the next question that, does this alteration of albumin have clinical implications, which was beautifully shown by Dominicini et al. and hepatology, which showed that when this albumin undergoes post-transcriptional changes and as cirrhosis worsens, what we see if we take a cutoff of native human serum albumin of less than 44 and more than 44, we see the overall mortality and survival probability being different, which indicates that as albumin's function deteriorates, possibly it has an implication with mortality. Which again brings to the second question that Beyond the oncotic property of albumin, what is the evidence that we have to suggest that it has its other roles? In last year, in a beautifully made study in science, what they showed that if we compare uh, in the PBMCs, the levels of uh, inflammatory cytokines after you expose them to a CPG DNA, and you compare them to a non-osmotic substance, non-albumin osmotic substance like mannitol, the presence of albumin itself reduces the production of these inflammatory cytokines. Plus, Louis China's group in clinical gastroenterology in 2018 brought about this study in which they took patients who had a serum albumin level less than three grams, put them on albumin, and saw that the effective immune response after they reached the target albumin level over three grams was improved, which formed the basis of one of the studies which we will be coming to later on. So basically what albumin is in liver disease is a jack of all trades. It counteracts peripheral vasodilatation. It counteracts effective hypovolemia. It has got its antioxidant properties and it has a role in counteracting the systemic inflammation. But what is the actual evidence that we have for the use of albumin in cirrhosis? We have got certain established indications, certain doubtful indications and certain emerging indications which are coming up over the last couple of years. So what are those indications for which we have a very strong level of evidence with albumin? They are prevention of PICD, prevention of AKI, prevention of development of AKI once SBP is there, the diagnosis of HRS AKI, and the treatment modality in combination with vasoconstrictors for HRS AKI. But as you see, these are all short-term 
issues or short term things that are managed with albumin which brings up us to the moot point that is there for today that what is the role of maintenance albumin in liver disease as we search back and i did some literature search this question has been there for a long time and it starts off with dame sheila sherlock there's a paper back in the 1960s where she had almost thought the same questions that we are thinking today what she did was that she divided these patients with uh, patients who are getting albumin who were having ascites and divided them into two groups to give long term albumin if you can see the amount of infusions that they have been given given for a long period of time of about 1 to 14 to 16 months and what they found in the study that albumin infusions do not alter the course of the disease the only significant finding that's there in this paper is that when you give albumin on the day of albumin infusion the patients have a sense of well being besides that there is no other changes after this paper the only paper that has been there is in to back in 2005 by romanelli's group again it was a unblinded trial which has got its limitations in its mismatching with levels of the child classes as with the child scores of the baseline groups but this was an old study in 2005 where they have allocated into two groups 54 patients got albumin 46 patients did not get albumin the dose of albumin being 25 grams for a week in the first year they followed it up to the second year with again 25 grams every two week with a total follow up of 62 uh, months and they found that there was an overall survival difference which was significant in the group that received albumin vis-a-vis the one that did not but after 2005 it sort of went under the carpet and then we met our old friend again in 2018 in the often talked about paper over the last 2 years as the answer trial so we have to understand what the elements of the uh, answer trial is out of which the most important thing is that answer trial has had patients who had persistent uncomplicated ascites uncomplicated per se means that you don't have an sbp you don't have an aki you don't have an hrs physiology going on neither do you have refractory ascites the dose that they used was 40 grams twice weekly for 2 weeks followed by 40 grams weekly the main results are they have showed a survival improvement of about uh, 77% versus 66% overall mortality difference was about 30% plus they had reduced incidence of parasitosis development of refractory ascites sbp infections as well as hrs with additional secondary outcomes of quality of life and hospital admiss- uh, admissions but as soon as the answer came out we have next year the same year with solar et al's group coming up with a match trial which again we have to understand the population that they had taken the population was patients with ascites who were awaiting liver transplant they had not classified as to what type of ascites those patients had and here we had an additional drug that is mido which was added here we, the positive outcome from the study was a decrease in the pra levels and the aldosterone compared to the placebo but with respect to the overall probability of developing complications or one year mortality there was no difference so there was these two studies which brought about two contrary viewpoints and a lot of debate happened as to why these things had come up but some essential thing that needs to be understood is these two studies are in its essence different things in one arm we have an open label tri- trial which was other was a placebo control trial and the placebo drug that was there was mido in addition to albumin the baseline mel scores if you see in case of the match trial are quite high in comparison to the answer trial plus the duration of the, uh, the therapy that was there was 14 and a half months and in the match trial you had it for 63 days and you got patients who were taken up and off listed for transplant uh, for many a cases plus the dose its schedule was also different so it was two studies which have been really talked about but perhaps do not address the same issue the story of albumin in patients with refractory ascites per se not uncomplicated ascites not recurrent ascites has only been addressed in one study that was by the pascoli study again in live international 2018 where they had found that there was a significant difference in mortality as well as a significant difference in emergent hospitalizations control of ascites sbp development of hrs in all the cases so this was the only study in refractory ascites that gives us some evidence 
that long-term albumin does have a role. So what do we have out here? For the last year, we've got two meta-analyses that have taken place, which have compared basically these studies that have been there over starting from Sheila Sherlock's study, coming up to the last study from De Pascoli. And what they've found is that if you take per se for prevention of recurrence of ascites and prevention for paracentesis need, definitely albumin infusions have got an advantage. But when you come to the other parts, whether it is SBP or if it is all-cause mortality, then there is still no differences. But we have to keep in mind that these are studies which have got very heterogeneous populations that were taken up in doing this analysis. And which brings us to the next meta-analysis that was there, European Journal of Gastro last year, where they divided these studies into patients receiving short-term and long-term. Short-term defined as less than one month, long-term as getting it more than one month. And there, in that subgroup, when they took those patients where they had receiving albumin for more than one month, if you compare overall survival, they did, found, uh, they did find a difference in overall survival. And if you see the I values, they're quite significant, and which again brought us to the question that the meta-analysis themselves have still a contradictory viewpoints, primarily because the type of studies that they have been taking up. So the last part that needs to be addressed is what is this dose of albumin that we give? If you see the match trial, there's a different uh, dose. If you see the De Pascoli's paper, there's a different role. And if you see the answer trial, there's a different dose. So does long, high dose or low dose matter? There's only again one paper from Fernandez in Gastroenterology 2019 where they divided it as high means 1.5 grams per kg every week for 12 weeks. Low means one gram per kg uh, every two weeks. Here they, they found that if you use a higher dose of the albumin, your normalization of the serum albumin levels, as well as your control of your inflammatory cytokines is better when you use the higher dose. So do we have recommendation of maintenance albumin at this state? Again, these are very early periods because the studies are heterogeneous, but last year we have this from Paolo Angeli's group it is the uh, Italian Liver Society and the Transfusion Medicine Society from Italy, where they have sort of tried to bring about certain recommendations of use of long-term albumin, because the overall data is very heterogeneous. And so what they've suggested that long-term albumin as a treatment option per se, has a high quality of evidence, which is there from the ANSWER trial and the previous studies. If you use it as what the protocol for the ANSWER study is, Again, answer study itself makes it a high quality evidence. But if we go to refractory ascites, there is again only the one study that is there with the Pascoli study. So we still have to think about what the level of recommendation would be. These are very elementary uh, recommendations that has been made in this paper. And most importantly, the duration of albumin therapy, it has to be individualized. So as we transition from this stage of decompensated cirrhosis, there is another form of end stage liver disease that is acute decompensation and ACLF where the data with uh, al albumin infusions are coming up. Uh, what we talked about before was the attire study from Louis China's group. This is ILC, uh, Liver Congress, EASL this year. What they presented, the preliminary data of 829 patients with acute decompensated cirrhosis, everyone having a serum albumin level of less than 3.5. They randomized within three, 72 hours of ad, 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 admission to receive uh, 20 percent albumin and they found that the primary composite endpoint of new infection, renal infarction, dysfunction or mortality were similar. But they additionally found that it led to threefold higher differences in the albumin being infused as well as the later rate of adverse events. So what are the key takeaways that we come back from maintenance albumin therapy in ESLD? Robust indications still today only are for those four standard indications of albumin that is there. Long-term use may be useful in improving of ascites control as well as making more diuretic responsive. Refractory ascites, we still have to wait for more data. As per mortality and prevention of infections, again, it's a mixed bag. The questions that need to be addressed in future studies is that what are the doses that we are going to use? Which protocols are there for individual parts, like for non-infected ascites, for uncomplicated ascites, or when we go up to refractory ascites? Because as we move towards refractory ascites, possibly the liver disease has got more advanced. The amount of effective serum albumin concentration also advances. 
So the dosage may need to be altered in accordance to those things. Another point that needs to be addressed is when you bring about NASH as becoming the one of the emerging leading causes of cirrhosis and with the cardiovascular problems that are there with NASH, it's not going to be B and C patients anymore, elderly patients with underlying cardiac disease, the number of adverse events that long-term albumin infusions would be causing are still things to be addressed. But the most important thing, which perhaps any albumin trial that's going to come up over the next years is how do you design this trial? And that has and will be perhaps the Achilles heel of albumin in long-term use in liver disease. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Akash. That was a very nice summary of available data. I request for next talk, Therapeutic plasma exchange in ACLF or ALF, has it become a standard of care? Dr. Subrat K. Acharya, he is well-known hepatology faculty. Currently, he is pro-chancellor, KIIT University, Bhubaneswar, executive director, gastroenterology, Fortis Escort, Digestive and Liver Institute. Sir, Dr. Acharya. Thank you, Dr. Avi Soyan and Dr. Neera Saraf for providing me this opportunity to discuss some therapeutic plasma exchange in patient with acute liver failure and acute and chronic liver failure. And the question they have raised is, has it become a standard of care? We are all aware that acute liver failure as well as ACLF are severe catastrophic complications of liver injury associated with high short term in hospital mortality up to a tune of 50 to 70%. We also are aware that liver transplant is the only definitive therapeutic option improving the survival in such sick patients who are likely to die. However, transplant is limited by organ shortage. We are also aware that in liver failure, there is rise in pneumonia and because of liver damage, the prevalent innate immune system induces a cytokine storm and various modulator of systemic inflammatory response syndrome which spills over to the circulation, affecting extrahepatic organs, causing multi-organ dysfunction and accelerated death in the hospital. Removing conceptually the plasma, which contains the circulatory mediator of systemic inflammatory response, as well as cytokine, as well as ammonia, may buy time and prevent such multi-organ dysfunction, allowing liver to regenerate and improve spontaneous survival, as well as provide bridge to liver transplant. There are many uncontrolled study, but there is one randomized controlled trial of plasma exchange in acute liver failure, and all these studies have shown promising survival benefit. However, in contrast to acute liver failure, in acute and chronic liver failure, the evidences are less robust, despite the fact that they, the studies have shown survival benefit. In liver damage, particularly in acute liver failure, the liver cell necrosis releases many of the, uh, many of the proteins which are present in the liver cell as damage associated molecular pattern. And as I suggested, the prevalent innate immune system <laughs> through a perpetuating mechanism produces a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which slips or spills over to the circulation affecting extrahepatic uh, organs causing multi-organ dysfunction and death. So removing this plasma through a high, high volume plasma exchange can remove this damage associated molecular pattern, decrease the ammonia level and remove other mediators, thereby preventing multi-organ dysfunction and allowing liver cell to regenerate spontaneously, therefore improve their survival or provide bridge to transplant. Probably similar event occurs in acute non-chronic liver failure where on a pre-existing chronic liver disease, further liver injury <laughs> induces damage associated molecular pattern, innate immune response, improve, increase pro-inflammatory cytokines spilling over to the circulation and ammonia also rises. And uh, in chronic liver disease, there is a leaky gut and the gut bacteria may travel through the portal vein and becomes a pathogen associated molecular pattern perpetuating this innate immune response. We also know the endotoxin, which is the lipopolysaccharide or gram-negative bacteria's uh, surface coat, can induce nitric oxide 
decreased systemic vascular resistance, decreased mean arterial pressure, renal hypoperfusion, and renal failure, which accelerate death in such patients of various forms of renal failure. Therefore, conceptually, in such patients, if the blood is uh, transferred to a plasma exchange machine, which separate plasma from the formed element, either through membrane separator or by centrifugation, and then replace this plasma with fresh frozen plasma along with form element, they can be put back to the patients. Therefore, remove all this uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine or systemic inflammatory response syndrome modulators, improving their outcome. Indeed, to, uh, this is the first uh, randomized controlled trial comparing high volume plasma exchange with standard medical therapy uh, and this has caused a lot of excited, excitement among sepatologists and transplant physicians raising this question whether it can be provided as a standard of care as a first go. Indeed, this is a multicentric study done in three places in uh, Europe and in which 92 patients were randomized to plasma exchange and 90 were given standard conventional therapy. And in them, the plasma exchange volumes were quite high about eight to 12 liters per session and about one to two liters per hour. However, equivalent amount of breast frozen plasma was replaced and their endpoint was transplant free survival and secondary endpoint was survival after transfer. They also took a sample in this patient to find out whether the basic concept that this plasma removed this pro-inflammatory cytokine and as a result, affect immunomodulation and allowed time for the liver regeneration. And uh, what they showed, in fact, uh, as I showed in the initial slide, this is the survival frequency amongst patients who were discharged from the hospital and at the time of discharge. These both groups include patients who were trans listed for transplant and those who were transplanted, as I have pointed out in these tables. If you find equal number of transplants were done in both groups as the organs were available. Despite the transplant, overall survival amongst those patients who underwent plasma exchange were markedly better than who were treated with conventional therapy. Remember, the transplant frequency among both groups were practically the same. But interestingly, why this difference occur? Because those patients who didn't get transplant but had poor prognostic indication, they followed King's College criteria. In them, the plasma exchange made a difference improving survival significantly over the controls. However, in those who received transplant, the survival is same in both groups, indicating that the transplant should continue in this group of patients where organ, donor, <coughs> organ is available or there is no contraindication. But in those, those where transplant is not possible, in them, plasma exchange is making a difference in survival outcome. But they also went on to see whether the survival benefit is associated with other parameters which are associated with poor prognostic marker, like hemodynamic parameter. They saw there is marked significant increase in hemodynamic parameter in the form of mean arterial pressure increase, decrease in vasopressor requirements. And also they documented that patient undergoing plasma exchange and significant improvement in their prognostic marker like SOFA, CLIP, and SERS scores. And these were measured on zero to zero baseline, one to three days. And these are values over one to three days over the baseline. And these are the, and these are the standard medical therapy where such differences are not noticed. So they suggested, obviously plasma uh, exchange is removing vasoactive substances and also the various inflammatory cytokines. And therefore, this hemodynamic and prognostic markers are improving. And they went in to find out whether actually there is immunomodulation, whether actually the pro-inflammatory cytokines and other modulators are being removed. And they took patients who are undergoing plasma exchange as well as in the controls. And when they compared, they found actually patient undergoing plasma exchange, uh, they have significant decrease in dams, that is damage associated to molecular patterns which induces pro-inflammatory cytokines, and they also documented decrease in pro-inflammatory cytokines. They also documented very activated uh, markers of the cells like monocytes or neutrophils, which uh, produce mm -hmm. this pro-inflammatory cytokine. 
Therefore, they argued strongly that plasma exchange indeed is removing this pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is compromising on hemodynamic parameters, as well as causing a spillover of a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokine affecting extrahepatic organ, causing multi-organ dysfunction. And this therapy is improving this survival by removing this or by immunomodulation. The problem in this study that they're largely parasitic induced acute liver failure, whereas hepatitis virus are major cause of acute liver failure in the part of our country. And it took a long period, it took 12 years to include 182 patients, and there is no concert flowchart. Uh, obviously, they randomized it, but probably they randomized it in a fashion uh, which is not clear, and therefore may be very select cases. And there are other problems like lactate was not influenced, large volume of plasma were given. And second, the timing of high volume plasma exchange was not very clear in such patients, not uh, because early plasma exchange may mask prognostic marker and uh, uh, prevent those who need liver transplant with very poor prognostic marker, they may succumb. And late plasma exchange may not provide benefit. This needs clarification. <laughs> Further, those who are undergoing plasma exchange, those who are likely to improve or not likely to improve, should be qualified uh, to select patient for transplant. And uh, plasma can remove the antibiotics and antifungals, can cause hypothermia, can cause hemolysis, can cause sepsis. In this study, they didn't find much difference between the two groups, but these remains a matter of concern, need further clarification. Based on this single RCT, European Association study of light and guideline has provided that it has evidence level one and grade of recommendation one in patients of acute liver failure. And they have suggested it should be done early because it affects the immunomodulations. In fact, there are many uh, other studies, but these are not randomized studies. And I've listed them here. Uh, the problem is most of them are retrospective studies and they are cohort studies or case series. And therefore they're select cases and small number. The etiology is mixed. And most of the studies uh, do not have a comparative group. Only four cohort studies have a comparative group, but they are not underpowered because the sample size was not calculated to improve survival. Unlike in the uh, previous RCT, where sample size was calculated uh, with the assumption that there will be improvement of 20% uh, in survival rate amongst patients undergoing plasma exchange. And uh, such uh, uh, data were missing in all these studies. The plasma exchange regime was different some combined with additional uh, liver support system like continuous uh, renal replacement therapy or hemoperfusion. The duration was unclear. The amount of plasma given in each study was different. However, it showed over result, results showed this, uh, there was a survival benefit amongst patients who undergoing plasma exchange despite that it is underpowered. There was biochemical improvement despite the fact that there was no correlation with the outcome. The amount of plasma exchange grossly varied in the studies. The duration of studies is also different in various studies. The, there is no etiology specific studies. Uh, the evidence is in acute and chronic liver failure is less robust. There are many studies, as I mentioned here, and they are mostly cohort, again retrospective. There is uh, mostly done in HBV reactives on ACLF, predominantly in China study. And none of the studies has used high volume plasma exchange, as I documented about 15% of body weight was changed to induce the immunomodulation. But here they did uh, most of the study use very low volume plasma exchange per sessions and number of sessions is also not uniform. But uh, many combined also with plasma exchange with other non-biological liver support system. But despite all these differences, most studies reported improved survival, most studies reported biochemical changes, but correlation with the outcome was not evident. This is a single randomized controlled trial in hepatitis B virus uh, reactivate, reactivation associated with the ACLF, in which uh, the plasma exchange was uh, shown to have significantly better out, 30 days outcome over controls. And since they were serotic, if they followed up them for five years, and that how indeed at five years also, patient undergoing plasma exchange is a better outcome than those who are treated with controls or standard medical therapy. And uh, they did a meta-analysis and found plasma exchange was an independent prognostic marker in 30, improving 30 days survival. The hazard risk actually was 0.74, indicating that 36%, 26% uh, reduction in the mortality. 
there are uh, meta analysis of two more studies of 30 and 90 days mortality uh, particularly on the survival and that's meta analysis so there's a distinct improvement in survival outcome and therefore in summary i will say plasma exchange has provided proof of concept that high volume plasma exchange can be a therapeutic option in both acute and uh, acute liver failure and acute and chronic liver failure question is can it be a standard of care i think we need more evidence and more properly designed randomized control trial in consecutive patient with similar baseline variable that influences the outcome we today know there are dynamic models of acute liver failure and on day 3 you can indeed distinctly distinct distinguish will survive will not survive now that factor has to be included in all this randomized control trial for example the randomized control trial which i discussed and they underwent three days uh, plasma exchange for example it, it is unclear whether on day 3 in the plasma exchange group there could have been improvement spontaneous uh, improver which has been included and that has resulted in improvement in pl high volume plasma exchange that is not clear that's why it is important and uh, uh, i therefore i suggest that plasma exchange may be performed as a part of randomized control trial with stratified met method keeping all variables in mind both in acute liver failure and acute and chronic liver failure and uh, because uh, in them must remember the prognostic score change over time and therefore they need to be evaluated while plasma exchange is performed and they need to be adjusted uh therefore recommendation for uniform care will depend upon such studies and probably should not be based on a single randomized control trial with dominant one etiology that is paracetamol and we know immunological modulator in hepatitis and drug induced uh, low failure of may be different and resource as you have suggested you need about say 23 liters in 3 days of plasma exchange in acute liver failure and that will remain a logistic constraint in many centers therefore before we recommend that it can be a standard of care we i think we have miles to go before such decision can be taken thank you thank you sir for summarizing a difficult and little controversial topic i request questions or comments by chair persons Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Samir or Dr. Ravi, if you want to start, because I asked question to Dr. Uh, uh, Friedman. So, uh, okay. I have one question regarding Armenian therapy. Uh, Pre-operatively, we know there are you know different schools of thought. You know, some may use you know weekly or this thing, but post-operatively, what is the uh, ideal albumin levels you would like to keep, and uh, what are the implications? post operative post transplant do we give albumin regularly or do we you know uh, what is the basis for albumin therapy in post operative period i think as a uh, as in the surgical perspective albumin is used there is a paper which actually analyzes i think in 2019 as to what are those indications for which we do use albumin in routine care and so one of those uses was post surgery particularly for post liver transplant what the data is that uh, i'm not sure of any paper that is there which deals with this but it's definitely used and studies have shown possibly some benefit but again there are uh, no rcts that are there to my knowledge which does address this question is the albumin going to improve you know uh, can we uh, the physiological and then can we discharge the patients early because you know most of them are in anasarka and uh, some of them have you know a uh, uh, lot of edema and so discharge can be delayed so are there any so physiologically if we see or uh, it makes absolute sense to use albumin as a replacement fluid especially in these patients but again whether it actually works and how how different it would be if we don't use it that's not been addressed but physiologically it absolutely use, uh, makes sense and a lot of surgery data is perhaps is there which does show the use of albumin in not only post liver transplant but other surgeries also thank you yes sir the, do we yes, have sir. time for any comment a quick comment sir uh, dr samir you want to make no oh, okay so uh, i think this is uh, again uh, professor acharya is there i thought let me share our experience with the plasma exchange in aclf and uh, 
just a small comment that we have done our pilot work uh, in alcohol related aclf whatever data is available was in hepatitis b so our major problem in this part of the country we know is alcohol so we had taken around 30 patients with alcohol related aclf a uh, moderate grade arc of you know 8 to 10 and those who did not have transplant prospects number 2 and those who did not improve on standard medical care for one week their arc score didn't improve by improve by two or more only those patients were you know then given this plasma exchange and we did show again there was no survival benefit 30 day and 90 day but yes there all the prognosis score severity scores whether it was mdf arc score meld everything improved their ammonias their bilirubin inr everything improved small study but then a concept we thought alcohol related aclf we did not have any data thank you sir well ajay i'm sorry my uh, video doesn't work right sir that's good information but uh, the problem is even in the alcohol aclf the variables right. are so wide Absolutely. for example the duration of alcohol for example the degree of cirrhosis because the clinical scores after a certain critical period are same so they are a heterogeneous group is very difficult actually uh, by delaying plasma exchange in them you might have taken away the survival benefit so they should be done from as i pointed out from the very start and then you continue to evaluate the dynamic models right and have a dynamicity correlated with survival that is what you need because this disease as you understand as you have seen yeah. even with spontaneous therapy it changes question we have learned from previous experience that in such interventions the dynamic changes need to be assessed right that is the delta values need to be assessed to find out the factors which will actually will help in identifying those who will survive with plasma exchange or those who has to go for liver transplant yeah okay sir that is what i i i i think so that is the way you have to look into this heterogeneous group thank you sir for this comment i thank all speakers and chairpersons we end this session for next session i invite chairpersons dr hardik kotecha he is senior consultant gastroenterology and hepatology at jaidas hospital ahmedabad dr alan contraris he is hepatobiliary and transplant surgery usa dr sanjeev rohatgi he is consultant transplant surgeon at manipal hospitals bangalore and dr sham bansal he is director of nephrology and kidney transplantation and medanta i invite first speaker dr anil aroda he is chairman institute of liver gastroenterology and pancreatobiliary sciences at sir gangaram hospital delhi sir uh uh thank you sir i am extremely grateful to the medanta transplantation team including dr soin dr neeraj and the other members of the family for inviting me this talk i am just sharing my slides are my slides visible yes sir is my voice clear yes the topic which has been allotted to me is post transplant metabolic syndrome greetings from uh, sir gangaram hospital where i am working as a consultant metabolic syndrome was first thought of as a unique entity when in 1923 kailin et al tried to establish a relationship between gout hypertension and hyperglycemia then subsequently during the time of our independence in 1947 wave demonstrated a link between abdominal obesity and metabolic de derangements in diabetes and cbd and finally in 1988 we have this definition of metabolic syndrome or syndrome x by riven in 1988 so metabolic syndrome as of today we define it as a met as a commonly used term for a cluster of clinical and metabolic factors that increase the risk of coronary artery disease type 2 diabetes mellitus and stroke in fact there are interrelated risk factors which include 
सेंट्रल ओबिसिटी डिसलिपिडीमिया हाइपर टेंशन हाइपर कोगुलेबल स्टेट एंड इंसुलिन रेजिस्टेंस इन फैक्ट मेटाबोलिक सिंड्रोम नॉट ओनली इज एसोसिएटेड विद कॉमन एंटिटीज विच आई मैं बट ऑल ऑफ अस नो एज हेपेटोलॉजिस्ट दैट in non alcoholic fatty liver disease the major association is found to be with metabolic syndrome it is also associated with extra hepatic manifestation in the form of polycystic ovaries hypogonadism and obviously this obstructive sleep apnea syndrome in addition vascular dementia central lesion and increased propensity to develop malignancy is a part and the parcel of of the metabolic syndrome which occurs because of the hyperinsulinemia as the very fact that you have metabolic syndrome compared to a normal healthy person you have five times higher risk of developing diabetes as well as three times higher risk of developing coronary artery disease and all of them tend to have ominous implication especially in the post transplant setting when the patient especially in country like ours where has spent both his donor as well as huge amount of money to get all right with liver disease alone overall in india metabolic syndrome is prevalent in the to the tune of about 18% and about 10% of the affected males in the total population do have metabolic syndrome how do we define this metabolic syndrome i think the most common accepted definition is the one given by international diabetes federation in in a, in a condition in which you have a bmi of more than 30 coupled with at least two of the following which include hyperglycemia hypertension raised triglycerides or low hdl less than uh, less than 50 in uh, men and less than 14 in women so this is how we define metabolic syndrome in the present scenario in patients with metabolic syndrome after i think uh, in fact metabolic syndrome tends to increase in transplant pa patient with passage of time 30 to 40% of the patient over the next 5 years will develop diabetes 40 to 60% will have dyslipidemias 50% will develop hypertension hyperuricemia occurs in substantial majority of the patient and obesity which is a harbinger of almost all what has been mentioned on the top of obesity is tends to occur in 18 to 30% of the patient in patient who have nash cirrhosis all of us know that today it is one of the commonest causes of liver disease all over the world it is the second commonest cause of liver transplantation in developed world and nash tends to recur after liver transplantation and the reasons are you have an underlying obesity hyperlipidemia diabetes and then if you are steroid dose and duration treatment after liver transplantation are the common predictors for the recurrence of nafld after liver transplantation so what you are trying to correct in patient with underlying metabolic syndrome with nash undergoing liver transplantation is just the liver you are leaving behind anything and everything for, uh, for which you already had developed a bad liver disease so the very fact that you continue to have the basic metabolic abnormalities you are likely to have recurrence of the disease liver transplantation resolves the complication of nash related cirrhosis however the metabolic factors as i mentioned they tend to remain in the same patient that coupled with immunosuppression with steroids and cnis tends to aggravate the problem so once a patient after liver transplantation develops metabolic syndrome there are two variants of this this is called recurrence of nash or recurrence of metabolic syndrome in patient after liver transplantation the two variants are recurrence in which the patient already had a diagnosed nash for which we had subjected him to liver transplantation or else patient was operated for something else he was transplanted transplanted for say hepatitis b c or hcc and in the post transplant period he develops a liver transplantation these two types forms of liver steatosis they carry different prognosis recurrent nfld appears to be more severe and irreversible in those who have de novo nafld that means if you have substantial nafld occurring after liver transplantation then you are likely to have more problems there are number of factors which determine which patients are likely to have more problems after liver transplantation these include host factors the very fact that you are obese prior to transplantation or else if you tend to gain weight after liver transplantation if you tend to develop all known metabolic components like diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia 
or with increasing age, you are more likely to have these problems. There may be environmental factors, including lack of exercise, sedentary lifestyle, increased intake of fat and sucrose, re resumption of alcohol intake, and the use of immunosuppressive agents like prolonged use of steroids because of the underlying conditions like autoimmune hepatitis, etc., and the concomitant use of calcineurin inhibitors at a dose more than what is typically needed in some patients. That has to be coupled with the underlying genetic factors which predispose you to development of the metabolic syndrome in the form of either ethnicity or, or presence of an underlying uh, uh, PNPLA3 genetic predisposition. So the various factors which tend to produce metabolic syndrome includes use of steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, and mTOR inhibitors. So steroids are and the calcineurin inhibitors are the most potent drugs which are known to cause metabolic syndrome because not only they produce dyslipidemia, but they also cause hyperglycemia and hypertension. So a combination of dyslipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes tends to uh, produce a syndrome called metabolic syndrome in patient in the post-transplant phase. All of us know prevention is better than cure. So why not take care of the factors which can be managed easily? So what do we do in treating and first preventing the development of the metabolic syndrome after liver transplantation is we must change the dietary habits and lifestyle, especially in patients who had metabolic syndrome prior to liver transplantation. We, they need our important attention to the minutest details, both in terms of the usage of the drugs, which are which predisposed to development of the metabolic syndrome and the lifestyle changes, which predispose you to development of obesity, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. So attention to the adverse <clears throat> effects of the immunosuppressive agents, advocating personalized medication is extremely important. And recently there has been a concept that if you use a combination of basiliximab induction and glucocorticoid free or CNI minimization minimize concentration for use of as an immunosuppressive drugs, you are more likely to have prevention of metabolic syndrome that is far more uh, easy than trying to treat it. In fact, long-term benefits in reduction of hypertension occur in the first year post-transplantation. I think it is high time we realize that if we have to do something as a preventive measure, we should bet on the first year well, this is the time if you we, uh, uh, intervene early in terms of prevention of the weight gain, adequate control of the diabetes, trying to minimize the immunosuppressive drugs which are known to predispose to development of the metabolic factors, we can do a good job in controlling the redevelopment of metabolic syndrome. In non-transplant cohorts of the patient with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, that lifestyle changes are associated with weight loss of about 10%. And then we know that with the reduction of the weight, at least in the non-transplantation setting, we know it reduces steatohepatitis and there is also some suggestion that it can reduce the development of the fibrosis. In fact, in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, if you do it surgery for in the terms of bariatric surgery, and if you tend to lose a BMI reduction of more than 10%, then you tend to develop a substantial improvement both in NASH as well as in the fibrosis in the liver. But in the post-transplantation setting, we had very few results. In a study of 37 patients with BMI of th more than 35, who underwent only liver transplantation and weight loss prior to liver transplantation, were compared with seven patients who underwent both liver transplantation as well as a sleeve gastrectomy. In fact, there was a higher weight gain, steatosis, post-transplantation diabetes, graft loss, and death in patients who underwent only liver transplantation, thereby Significant, signifying that if you have a pre-op occurrence of all metabolic factors which predispose to development of the post-op metabolic factors, they are going to produce more damage to the liver than what can be seen in the absence of these factors. What is important is the dose and the duration of the immunosuppression and interaction with the various drugs during transplantation procedure, follow-up, complication, and the donor-related factors. In fact, the, one of the best medication to sensitize the liver to produce insulin is the or, and the pancreas to produce insulin are the drugs like metformin and PPR agonists like thia, uh, like pioglitazone. There is little evidence in the literature 
the uh, there is a little uh, evidence in the literature that these drugs have any role in the post transplantation setting over and above the pre transplant setting in fact the best results of the utility of vitamin e and the uh, uh, pioglitazone come from dr arun sanyal study in in uh, 84 subjects with uh, a non alcoholic fatty liver disease in which it was clearly shown that both vitamin e and pioglitazone in non non diabetic nafld tend to decrease the occurrence of inflammation but not the fibrosis but then there has been no corresponding literature in the post transplant setting showing the utility of any of these agents in management of uh, post transplantation uh, metabolic factors sir, we I know steroid sir i request to sum up yeah okay thank you uh, in fact the drugs which are known to cause the uh, uh, post transplant diabetes and metabolic Uh, factors include steroids cnis and mtor inhibitors the safest bet is with mycophenolic acid and once you have these drugs a, a combination of basiliximab induction combined with mmf gives you the best result because basiliximab and the mmf and glucocorticoid free treatment as immunosuppressive therapy gives you the best result in prevention of the metabolic syndrome and once you have metabolic syndrome the best thing is to prevent especially in the first year of post transplantation liver setting the most important factors which tend to produce these changes after liver transplantation include the use of steroids cnis and the mtor inhibitors and with minimum use of these drugs and early lifestyle changes we should be able to prevent occurrence of uh, post transplantation metabolic syndrome in substantial majority of the patient so to sum up ladies and gentlemen if we act early in the first year by lifestyle changes adequate control of diabetes dyslipidemia and hypertension we may be able to prevent post transplant metabolic syndrome which is becoming a nuisance uh, because of the presence of the these very factors prior to liver transplantation thank you thank you dr aruda we will have questions at the end i request dr nazia she will speak on she is associated professor of medicine university of toronto medical director ldlt system toronto general hospital she speaks on post transplantation ascites dr nazia please good morning everyone can everyone see my uh, screen is it shared and everyone can hear me well yes fine Perfect. So first of all, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Soin and all the organizing committee for the kind invitation. Uh, and uh, again, we wish all we could be in Medanta, but uh, instead I'm in the cold, uh, snowy Toronto today. Um, I have been given the task to talk about the ascites post liver transplantation. I'll do the, my best to cover this topic, which, uh, as you are going to see. is a very heterogeneous topic with numerous um, uh, um, parameters or etiology uh, and uh, mechanism uh, causing that so we all know that in the setting of liver cirrhosis uh, ascites is related to uh, changes uh, alteration in the splanchnic system as well as uh, abnormal renal function uh, that is caused uh, by systemic uh, circulation changes mainly increased cardiac output uh, reduced uh, vascular resistance uh, peripheral vascular resistance as well as um, change uh, activation of uh, neurohormonal parameters however it is assumed that post a successful liver transplantation the hemodynamic changes should uh, modify or improve within a few days to a weeks or uh, and therefore ascites should resolve um therefore having some mild to moderate ascites post liver transplantation is not unusual however persistent ascites uh, is uncommon post liver transplant and it's described very um Uh, um in in the uh, with a frequency of uh, less than 5% in the setting of disease donor liver 
transfer patient and uh, up to five, 50 percent in some of the literature in the setting of live donor liver transplant. What I want also to point out is that the definition of persistence aside is, is very um, uh, various uh, depending to different literature that you look at. However, the uh, International Ascites Club described this as uh, persistent ascites for more than four weeks after a successful uh, liver transplantation. There is no doubt, and we all know that from our uh, experience uh, that persistence ascites post liver transplantation is associated with uh, impaired renal function, increased intraabdominal infection, uh, prolonged hospitalization, and overall uh, reduced survival. And there are no more data showing uh, that both in the setting of disease donor liver transplant, that's the left hand side graph, as well as in the setting of uh, this uh, live donor liver transplantation, persistence as I is is associated with significantly less uh, survival compared to patients who don't have ascites. As I mentioned earlier, the etiology of ascites post liver transplantation is very heterogeneous. Uh, typically, we can divide it in two big categories. One is related to the anatomical vascular cause. And under that umbrella, we have causes such as inadequate uh, venous outflow, inflow abnormality, or small for size syndrome. And then we have all the non-anatomical cause which include bacterial or fungal infection, uh, carcinomatosis, heart failure, renal failure, and uh, finally recurrence of original disease on the graph that leads to portal hypertension and development of ascites. I'm not gonna go through each of these causes, but I want to briefly talk about two main uh, anatomical causes, which one of them is inadequate venous outflow. Um, that's again, a rare situation, three to 7% uh, of all transplants, uh, um, definitely lower in the disease donor liver transplant. The cause could be either stenosis of hepatitis, uh, hepatic veins, or uh, IVC anastomosis, um, onset could be acute, uh, mostly technical complication, kinking, hematoma, or secondary, such as stenosis or st external compre uh, compression of the veins. Regardless, the clinical manifestation includes ascites, lower limb edema, and renal failure. And um, there is uh, evidence now in the literature in that the type of anastomosis, whether it's end-to-end -end or piggyback, has no difference in, in the onset of um, venous outflow obstruction. The second um, anatomical um, cause of ascites is the uh, small for size syndrome, which is defined as uh, as a graft recipient versus uh, weight ratio less than 0.8. And uh, the clinical manifestation of this syndrome include a bilirubin over 10 uh, nanogram per deciliter and INR above 1.6, uh, evidence of encephalopathy and persistence ascites. And the mechanism of it is uh, increased uh, portal uh, um, hyperperfusion that causes uh, sinusoidal shear stress. Uh, endothelial and hepatocytes injury and ultimately delayed graft function leading to um, evidence of portal hypertension and ascites. So uh, the, now changing a little bit here and talking about uh, stepwise diagnosis of ascites post uh, liver transplant, um, similar to pre-transplant setting, uh, paracentesis is the first uh, step uh, with cell count uh, culture and cytology. Uh, a side measurement, uh, serum albumin to ascites uh, gradient is recommended to rule out portal hypertension uh, in echocardiography, transjugular liver biopsy, Doppler ultrasound, and venogram are all the next steps to look for a specific cause of ascites. Um, there are a few studies that have looked at a predictor of persistence ascites post liver transplant, mainly in the setting of live donor liver transplantation. The left-hand side uh, here, the table shows a predictor study uh, with over 400 live donor liver transplantation that was uh, published um, in transplantation recently. And the author in the multivariate regression analysis has come with a number of parameters here uh, that uh, they have no use uh, to, to um, 
create a predictive score that, that allows to predict the recurrence of uh, persistence as I did post transplant. And using that, they, uh, they uh, intervene uh, with uh, pre uh, preventive measurement, pre uh, transplantation to avoid this situation. The left, uh, on the right hand side, this is another study um, with mainly uh, left um, lobe uh, liver transplantation from Japan with uh, again about 200 um, transplant. And uh, once again, in their multivariate analysis, they found that cold ischemic time as well as pre transplant ascites are predictor of persistence ascites post-transplant. So in terms of management of ascites post-transplantation, similar to pre-transplant, sodium re restriction is recommended, uh, not more than 88 mol, uh, millimole per day. And we know, all know how difficult it is uh, for patients to adhere to this uh, strict diet. Diuretics, uh, large volume paracentesis, uh, fluid retention uh, are all steps that can be uh, taken in general for almost all patients. Um, in uh, particular settings that, such as uh, outflow obstruction, uh, specific treatment, including angioplasty uh, dilatation, or even better primary stent placement uh, is recommended with good outcome. And they have been um, good reports in the literature on that. Graft uh, uh, inflow modulation and or pharmacological treatment for a small for size, uh, as well as tips uh, or eventually retransplantation. I'm just going to end with two uh, slides on tips. Um, uh, use of tips post transplantation is mainly in the setting of recurrence of original disease. Uh, initial uh, studies have had uh, described technical difficulty for insertion of TIPS, uh, but this is no longer the case. Uh, most of um, recent uh, TIPS intervention has been uh, technically successful. However, as you can see here, the overall success of um, uh, TIPS in terms of reduction of ascites post liver transplantation is much lower uh, in the range of uh, 50 to 60 percent uh, compared to the TIPS uh, pre transplant. And this is a, a, another study that have used 200 uh, liver transplant recipient on their going tips intervention, you can see technical success is excellent. Clinical success, not that good. Only 50% success in terms of managing ascites. Revision was required in 16% cases and about a third of patients uh, had uh, worsening of their hepatic encephalopathy. And as you can see on the graph, the survival, um, short-term survival, 30 days uh, was associated with 11% mortality and longer-term survival was not uh, great. So just to uh, finish, in summary, persistence ascites post liver transplantation is rare, particularly in the setting of disease donor liver transplantation. The etiology of it is very multifactorial and heterogeneous. I went very, very fast over some of these etiologies. Um, definitely persistence ascites is associated with reduced long-term survival uh, of patients. And a multi-step approach to diagnosis and treatment is required to be able to uh, manage and control this uh, ascites uh, safely. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Nazia, for nice presentation and clear message. I request you to be there for if any question at the end of session. For last talk of today, I invite Dr. Dharmesh Kapoor. He will speak on chronic kidney disease. Dr. Dharmesh is Senior Consultant Hepatologist at Yashoda Hospital, Sikandarabad. Good evening, everyone. Are my slides visible? No, sir. We can hear you. We can see you. Slides are not visible. Are the slides visible now? Yes, sir. At the outset, I would like to thank the Medanta team for this invite. I know 10 minutes is too little a time for this topic. So we all know that liver disease 
is a major problem in end stage liver diseases characterized by abnormal level, uh, kidney function and the melt uh, based allocation score which was initiated in 2002 is is actually predicated on urgency of liver transplant that means patients who are extremely sick they need to be allocated the transplants at the organs first and there is a high weightage of serum creatinine value in the melt score and this has resulted in a number of patients being transplanted with actually renal dysfunction and one can see from this obtn uh, graph that almost uh, the number of cases of simultaneous liver and kidney transplant has increased exponentially ever since the meld allocation was introduced some of the common causes of both acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease and liver disease patients who undergo transplant are highlighted in table some points need special mention here so patients with acute kidney injury especially hepatorenal syndrome type 1 they get transplanted very frequently in the current uh, in the contemporary scenario and many of these patients might even have other organ failures especially in the context of acute and chronic liver failure diabetes hypertension is very common in patients who undergo transplant and we also have to factor in the fact that new onset of diabetes and hypertension as was alluded to in an earlier talk which are the components of metabolic syndrome is an added problem hepatorenal syndrome type 2 according to me is one of the commonest indications for liver transplant in our country and actually this is a chronic kidney disease and if time permits we can talk about the hrs aki and hrs naki which is further divided into acute kidney dysfunction as well as chronic kidney disease most importantly the primary glomerulonephritis they are not evaluated by most of us and we are uh, guilty of that ig nephropathy is extremely common in patients with end stage liver disease not just alcohol but other etiologies too it is understudied and underreported so what i am trying to say is that the 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 platform is ready for kidney dysfunction where uh, kidney dysfunction when these patients are undergoing transplant and then it's only a matter of time when a gruesome surgery like liver transplant and whatever follows after that adds to the renal dysfunction so from the nephrology perspective and i know there is a, a nephrologist as one of the uh, chairpersons for this talk the the relationship between aki and ckd has been known for a long period of time so one of the risk factors for chronic kidney disease is actually acute kidney injury and acute kidney injury patients have a high risk of developing chronic kidney disease and stage renal disease as well as mortality and the hazard ratios are mentioned in this one meta analysis also the relationship between the aki and ckd is actually graded on the basis of severity of aki so if you have an aki which does not need renal replacement therapy the chance of developing ckd or end stage renal disease is less than if you need renal replacement therapy also the size effect is dampened by a low baseline egfr and this actually is the punch line for the talk which means that if you have got a bad kidney function at the time you transplant someone this person is going to have a relatively unaltered course no matter what you do however if you have got a good egfr in a given patient who undergoes liver transplant this is the patient in whom you can seriously dent a negative outcome with respect to renal dysfunction provided one is careful so i will now walk you through a case which all of us see and this is common garden variety of patients who undergo transplant in most of the centers so this is the story of a 53 year old male history of alcohol related liver disease but also diabetes in the background of more than 13 years he had a trauma to the great toe in jan of 2019 when he was first diagnosed with liver dysfunction he developed renal dysfunction at this stage the serum creatinine value was 2.7 he received albumin and vasopressor therapy and ever since he had been needing large volume paracentesis he was referred to our center with renal dysfunction in august of 2020 his maximum creatinine values were 3.3 the diuretics were discontinued and received albumin and tolipressin there was an improvement in renal function with treatment and the creatinine value fell down to 1.3 and there was a strong family history of diabetes so this is the serial values of renal function that we had on this patient right from the time of his first presentation to any medical facility so as you can see there is a wide variation in the creatinine values in most instances this was due to the diuretics there was never any demonstrated sbp or any other infection in this patient and as you can see that in august of 2020 when he presented to us he had a creatinine value of 3.3 he underwent large volume paracentesis and even though there is no guidance on using vasopressors for patients with hrs ckd i thought this patient has got hrs akd or uh, naki akd or hrs ckd but he still received tolipressin and we all know that cosmetically we can modify the value of creatinine at the time he underwent transplant in october of 2020 his creatinine value was 1.1 1 
So these are the pre-op lab data. 24 hours urine protein was 65, which is a little surprising because I thought he has diabetes of 13 years duration. I was expecting to see more proteinuria. And you can see that the creatinine clearance is 42, which means that he is already CKD4. So this patient underwent uh, transplant. These patients are typically low melders. So meld was 10 and meld sodium was 14. He received the right lobe graft without MHV from his son. The GRWR was 0.8. And there was no intraoperative mishaps. And by this means, uh, I mean that he didn't receive any extraordinary number of transfusions or there were no hemodynamic mishaps or uh, uh, the fluctuations during the intraoperative course. Postoperatively, this is the course that this patient has followed. So I, I hardly ever see a patient who undergoes transplant in whom the creatinine value does not increase in the postoperative period. And this is because of a number of factors. And some of them are related to the pre-transplant condition of the patient, some due to intraoperative factors, and some due to the post-operative factors. So you can see that this patient's creatinine at the time of discharge, which is around POD 13, has dropped to 1.3, but the peak creatinine value at the end of first week after transplant was 3.2. He had reasonably good uh, graft function at the time of discharge, but now you can see that after two months of uh, uh, follow-up in the outpatient department, the creatinine has again started to creep up. So what is the general trend of uh, EGFR in a post-transplant scenario? In the first one month, the EGFR declines, and then it starts to pick up and stabilizes by around month three. Between month four and month 12, that is the time when the maximum decrement in the EGFR occurs, and that probably is the harbinger for the further deterioration in renal function in these patients. So what did our, our unit do with respect to the immunosuppression strategy? We do not use any IL-2 receptor antagonist induction in our uh, program. We introduced the mTOR inhibitors at times even de novo, but obviously very early post-transplant. We get the patient to the maximum tolerated dose of MMF, though we don't do the therapeutic drug monitoring. We delay CNIs or at times the patients would be on very, very low dose of CNIs. We hardly ever do the TDMs for CNI in a scenario like this. The corticosteroid withdrawal is as per protocol, which is less than six weeks in a patient who's got diabetes. And when you see a patient like this, even in the second month, one would start to monitor the mTOR dosage also, not the level. So this is the key that we start to monitor the mTOR dosage. Please see the bottom part of this chart, which is the UPCR. It is a very, very important function that you must monitor in these patients because you just don't need to go by the creatine values, but also the protein excretion in these patients. And especially when you are using mTOR inhibitors, one has to be extremely careful. So there are many problems in assessing renal function or dysfunction in end-stage liver disease, which are mentioned on this slide. So what we basically do is to continue to look at serum creatinine. I've already mentioned that you can cosmetically alter the serum creatinine values. It's very simple. Those of who do transplants know very easily how to do this. And the important is the fourth point that you see in the slide, that you should be having a good handle on the urinary protein creatinine ratio. We don't use the UACR, which is the albumin creatinine ratio, because it is more expensive and we get equally good results with UPCR. The literature is uh, uh, the, the flooded with the reports that the patients who undergo non-renal uh, solid organ transplants, they do fairly poorly with respect to renal dysfunction. This is the landmark study New England Journal published 18 years ago, which suggests that almost 18% of the patients at the end of five years and 25% of patients at the end of 25 years will develop some kind of CKD. This particular study, they defined the CKD with an EGFR of less than 30. And this was from the OPTN database, and this was more than 36,000 transplants. Single center uh, experiences might be more useful in this because the databases, you have centers giving various kinds of immunosuppression protocol. And this is again from uh, Baylor, Texas, wherein it can be seen that the number of patients who undergo renal transplant following a liver transplant is very small, just about 3% at the end of 10 years. But those who have end-stage renal disease or those who have got any kind of CKD at the end of 10 years is fairly substantial. So less than 15 mils per minute uh, EGFR in almost 10% of patients and any kind of CKD in up to 18% of patients at the end of one decade after transplant. So the post-transplant renal dysfunction is highlighted in this slide. We all know about these factors, but I think one would like to spend some time on the calcium urine inhibitor-based immunosuppression because this is the one which you can tweak. So this is the one which is the most important. Most of the immunosuppression strategies are based on the use of calcium urine inhibitors. And I suspect the earlier reports of patients undergoing uh, or having renal dysfunction post-transplant probably stem from our 
borrowed knowledge from the renal transplant space wherein the trough levels of uh, cnis was much much higher than what you need for liver transplant so i think that is something that needs attention however having said that we are now transplanting more and more patients with nafld nash cirrhosis and these patients have features of metabolic syndrome and as we heard from the previous speaker there is a strong association of the uh, nash cirrhosis with ckd2 so i think this is something that needs consideration from all of us so again the general principles to protect renal function are known to all of us but it is easier said than done so how do you identify patients with chronic kidney disease very very difficult in the case that i walked you through i am not sure whether we were dealing with recurrent hrs1 or whether we were dealing with the acute on chronic kidney disease i think it was the latter we all try to uh, minimize the nephrotoxic agents in the pre operative period optimize renal perfusion again easier said than done because whatever happens in the theater happens at such a brisk space pace that it can hardly be modified but what you can probably do in the post transplant uh, period is again to minimize the calcium urine inhibitor use because the renal function is one of the most important functions to preserve and this is the job of the hepatologist and consult with the surgeons and other colleagues in the team to make sure that the patient's renal function remains stable so to end what are the various immunosuppression strategies that one can uh, think of and this actually is also the types of ckd that you can see in the patient in the post transplant setting so maybe you can use induction therapy and there is a lot of published literature on this that you can delay the cni initiation to day 4 to day 7 so most centers now use basiliximab at time point 0 and day 4 we don't use induction therapies in our program low dose cnis early or de novo mtor inhibitors most studies with mtor inhibitors have used mtor inhibitors at week 4 we don't follow that protocol we are very happy to use ab initio mtor inhibitors in patients whom we suspect to give trouble with respect to renal function once you have egfr decline and you want to do your immunosuppression modification probably it would not be of much use and there was a good study published some years ago by fauzi saliba's group which was the rescue trial so if you want to initiate or switch from cnis to mtor inhibitors late in the course of transplant when the egfr has already declined the protective effect of mtor inhibitors is lost and then in spite of all your efforts if somebody has indeed developed established ckd then many of these patients will go off cnis as well as mtor inhibitors and one would again have to fall back upon a very low dose of corticosteroids and anti metabolites i thank you for your attention and i'll be very happy to take any questions thank you dr dharmesh i invite chair persons for any comments or suggestions or questions dr sham dr allen yeah so i thought uh, some previous uh, talks moderated so dr dhamesh uh, nice to hear your talk so in this patient like you gave example of a patient with diabetes and he had kidney dysfunction but i am not sure what was the cause of his kidney dysfunction because as a diabetic nephropathy he should have proteinuria so to say whether this patient had proteinuria and diabetic nephropathy and ckd because of that i am not so sure because because usually the patient would have proteinuria and secondly this patient actually attained a creatinine of 1.98 at the time of discharge or day 24 or something like that and after that his creatinine started increasing <clears throat> so what happens typically in any transplant patient because once the patient is transplanted they gain they uh, they gain the muscle mass they lose the fluids and that's how the whether it's a patient of kidney transplant or liver transplant they start getting is the creatinine slightly increases and because uh, uh, i in kidney like like there is a lot of hesitancy in the liver people to for the cni uh, for them because rejection is not probably very important but if you see from the perspective of kidney transplant and we keep our tax levels or levels around uh, higher than the people with liver transplant and we hardly see uh, actually cni toxicity and nowadays it has been established because previously if you remember 20 years back there was a paper by nankiwal in new england journal of medicine and they said ki people who are on cni they have uh, cni nephrotoxicity and they develop uh, 100% of patient over a period of 10 year develop nephrotoxicity and which theory actually that actually later on it was proved 
कि दिस इज ऑल मोस्ट ऑफ दिस इज क्रॉनिक रिजेक्शन इट्स नॉट सी एन आई टॉक्सिटी एंड देर इज अ लॉट ऑफ एक्चुअली डिफरेंसेज इन द रिपोर्टिंग ऑफ द बायोपसीज एंड मोस्ट ऑफ दीज पेशेंट विद द इंट्रोडक्शन ऑफ सी फोर डी इन बायोपसीज आफ्टर ट्रांसफॉर्म it was found that this patient has rejection so but but actually i am not a liver transplant specialist so i can't comment on these things because there's a problem with using mtor inhibitors uh, that if the patient has proteinuria and if you are going to use mtor inhibitor this proteinuria is going to increase and in the long term proteinuria is definitely detrimental for kidney function so that, that is well taken so that's why i said that when we are assessing uh, assessing the egfr or the renal function or dysfunction prior to transplant we should not just look at the creatinine values or the egfr but also the protein excretion so i think there are a number of unknowns about the mtor induced proteinuria one really doesn't know whether that proteinuria means much or not but of course it is disconcerting so one would be lying if one were to say that somebody is having a proteinuria of 1 gram per day and you would not Uh, you know uh, turn your attention to it but uh, i would also like to say at the same time that even the renal literature is very mixed so you know you guys have a benefit of using the term chronic allograft nephropathy so i really don't know whether such a term has been described in liver transplant setting but i think it should be described because the chronic allograft nephropathy is actually a mix of a number of things so it's immune mediated non immune mediated cni Uh, just to just to interrupt you now this term has been discontinued uh, so there are specific etiologies so yeah. it's a chronic antibody mediated also the the c4d in the liver space is still not uh, widely accepted so the so chronic allograft was used till 2010 or so but after that this term has now not been used mm -hmm. so depend on the etiology what is the etiology of the uh, renal dysfunction after transplant it is whether it is a chronic antibody mediated rejection or it's because of the some uh, diabetic changes or hypertensive changes or some other changes so that term but because that included a lot of things and that was not the right uh, actually term for uh, the kidney dysfunction uh, okay guys uh, we need to we need to wind up soon alan yeah. would you like to make a comment Yes, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, congratulations to to the Medanta Institute. Uh, this is a quick question for Dr. Selzner. So, uh, having ascites after transplantation is always a question for the surgeon. If we have an outflow problem, so the question could be, when should we worry? Because you know, paracentesis is very difficult to interpret because uh, the surgical event. And the second question could be, what would be the stepwise approach? Uh, because most of these patients, as Dr. Harsha has told us, they have kidney failure or acute kidney injury. So, should we go right ahead and do a CT scan, or maybe just take the patient to the cath lab if we have really suspicion of problems with the outflow? Um, yes, thank you for this question. A uh, very good question. Obviously, I'm not a surgeon. I'm a transplant hepatologist, but we do see a lot of uh, these issues. I, as a matter of fact, uh, I just had a patient last week and uh, who uh, was a few years post live donor liver transplantation. I think if you have a good uh, access to ultrasound Doppler, they should be very easily uh, assess the, the vessels and uh, make the diagnosis. You won't need to go to uh, radiology and do a venogram or, or uh, use of any contrast. Uh, but if, in case if the Doppler is inconclusive, uh, despite renal function, you need to do the diagnosis because this is a, a situation that you need to intervene fast. This patient needs to be treated fast, otherwise they will lose their graft with congestion. So uh, inserting a stent is, would be the next step uh, and uh, the diagnosis has to be done fast despite the uh, renal compromise. And in many cases, once it's done, actually the renal function improves quite fast. I, I, can I, I'll just put in a comment here. I uh, agree with you, Nazia, that the index of suspicion has to be high, even though uh, inherently I feel like telling you there never is an outflow problem, but that's not correct, obviously. Okay. Um, so I, I agree that uh, in persistent ascites, You can actually solve most of these problems by being persistent. So uh, there has to be a high index of suspicion for outflow obstruction. And if a previously monophasic or a biphasic um, Doppler remains the same and the patient is fine, it's okay. But if it was previously triphasic Doppler and then it has become biphasic or monophasic, 
that should definitely raise a huge index of uh, suspicion. And one is best doing these Dopplers after tapping any ascites if there isn't a brain. So once you've got an empty tummy, that's the time to actually interpret the Doppler. And if your index of suspicion is high, I would go right in for a venogram if the, if the renal function is bad. Otherwise, of course, uh, standard um, uh, triphasic CT angiography will solve the problem. So with this, um, I'd like to uh, close today's session. Thank you very much, Dharmesh and uh, Anil and Nazia, especially you, uh, you know, having tuned in from halfway across the world before you start your day, I gather. And, uh, and thanks uh, all the chairpersons. Uh, we've had a very, very lively discussion. I'm sorry it carried on a bit. Narendra, thank you for emceeing like a champion. So before you all go off, I have to tell you that we have half an hour of uh, a cultural music program for you if you'd like to stay in and watch. Otherwise, thank you very much and we'll see you again tomorrow. Thank Neelam, you. Mohan, you. Uh, would you like to take off from here? Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thank you, Dr. Swan, for inviting So, very happy for you to stay on for the cultural. Good program. night, all. Is Dr. Neelam Mohan taking over? Yes, just, just wait a minute. Doctor Swain. Yes, I'm there. Uh, sir Nitesh here. Yeah. Sir, today there is no culture program. It's tomorrow. I thought there was initially half an hour today also, no? No, yesterday it was there, and uh, then we have it uh, on twenty third. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, Alan and Nazia and others were still there. I've just been informed that the cultural program is actually for tomorrow, and I was mistaken. I'm sorry. So, we'll see you tomorrow at the meeting and at the cultural program. Uh, Absolutely. Good morning. I mean, nice to see you. Nazia, nice good morning. To see you. Uh, nice to see everyone. Same. Good morning. Good evening. Bye bye. Yes. <laughs> have a good day. See you tomorrow. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.